Thank you all for being here today. My name is Dwayne Chung. I am an organizer for Direct Action Everywhere, which is an animal rights network that started in the Bay Area about a year ago, and now has expanded to having actions that have cities participating around the world. I think our most recent uh, campaign, It's Not Food, It's Violence, has now 37 cities in 12 or 13 countries around the world that have participated. We've got national media coverage in Salon.com on some of our campaigns, and in last month's action, we shut down Chipotle Mexican Grill's largest store in San Francisco for a few hours in anticipation of a protest. So we do a lot of very creative, provocative actions, and I think a lot of people in our community around the world don't necessarily understand the amount of thought that went into this campaign and the idea of direct action ever. And people are always asking, you know, what are all these crazy animal rights activists doing? And we're the craziest of the craziest. And so what we wanted to do with this meeting is kind of give you a sense of both how direct action ever started and why we do things the way we do them. Because again, there has been a lot of thought, a lot of strategy, a lot of research into, into the model of activism we're using. So the subject for today's talk, obviously, is why direct action ever. Just the structure of the talk is we're going to have a separate organizer talk about each of our five organizing principles. And the way we kind of decided what to do with direct action ever was we first set an objective. We found a team of people who could execute that objective. And we came up with a set of organizing principles that would help us implement that objective in a very effective way. So what was the objective we set up for ourselves? Well, there were three things that we saw kind of missing in the animal rights activism that all of us were participating in prior to Direct Action Network that we wanted to change in the activism that we wanted to do. Um, the first is we wanted to have a big impact. So there, there is so much animal rights activism going out there. There's so much activism of all different stripes going out there. And there's a lot of research suggesting that the average intervention in charitable causes is, is very, very low impact that systems that we're living in are extremely robust, it's hard to affect change, and especially if you're talking about things that are going to last six months, a year, or even decades, and when you're talking about changing very complex systems and very big, powerful institutions, you often find that impact is very low. Um, the second thing we want to do was achieve growth. We, we saw that there was latent potential in this movement. 70% of the households in this country have a companion animal. Half of those households buy their companion animals, Christmas presents and birthday gifts. So there's love for animals out there. There's potential for growth in this movement. But for most of this movement's history, we've been stuck at 1%, 0.5%, or even 0.1% of the movement, depending on what measure you're using in evaluating the movement size. So we thought that there was potential for massive growth. 1% would be 1% of the population of the United States. So, and 1% would be the number of vegetarians or vegans. And it depends a lot on which survey you use. Some surveys estimate up to 5%. Some surveys suggest 1%. It depends a lot on the framing, it depends on the sample of the population that you're sampling from. But whatever, whatever the exact metric, what's, what's absolutely certain is that we have far fewer people than we need to achieve real and robust permanent change for the animals. So the third thing is a lot of us just had a vision. We, we believe that there is, there is a greater and more inspirational vision that we could achieve, that we could dream big and achieve those dreams. And most of the animal rights activism we had been participating up until direct action ever was more or less settling for what we thought was um, insufficient vision for what we can achieve as a movement. So you can't just have an objective, you also have, have to have people. And a big part of what caused Direct Action Everywhere to start was a number of chance encounters. And the first chance encounter was at a restaurant called Happy Bamboo. And up until this point, I just moved to the Bay Area from Chicago. I was kind of lost as both a person as an activist. My mother was dying of cancer. My, my activism and my, my social scene had sort of fallen apart because I had to fly out to the Bay Area just on a lark to help my mom with a very debilitating illness. And my aunt had come to visit us from Taiwan, and I picked her up from the airport, and I was driving her back to Santa Cruz to visit my mom. Um, and we got stuck in traffic. And I pulled off the highway just because we were so frustrated with the traffic, and I happened to Google vegan restaurants and go to this restaurant, Happy Bamboo. And up until this point, I had been in the area, I think, for two and a half months at that point. I had not done basically any activism after spending kind of in my entire life for 12 years focused entirely on animal rights for the past two months of my life. I'd basically done nothing. And I just happened to see this strange guy with, with a woman posting a flyer on strange. Happy and Bamboo. This is the strange guy right here. Camera, you can't see him, but it's Ronnie Rose. And I thought to myself, oh man, there's so much going on in my life. Should I talk to him? There's, you know, I'm under so much stress. Let's start this new job that's incredibly, incredibly um, time demanding. And my mom is facing this debilitating illness. But I thought, all right, this is an opportunity. And I need to go talk to this guy. So I, so I said, hey, what are you doing? What is this? And I think Ronnie was a little taken aback. You can, you can share more details yourself by just how aggressive I was. But I was, I was excited. I thought, this is an opportunity for me to meet somebody. Um, and if I hadn't met Lonnie, I have no idea what would have happened with Direct Action Network. But really, I mean, when we look at how much we've accomplished, this is in August of 2012, just a little over a year ago. 
Um, and if I hadn't met Ronnie and talked to him and engaged in this really productive dialogue over the next week or two over animal rights activism and, and, and what he was doing, and I think, Ronnie, you were kind of in a similar place in the sense that you were involved in some activism, but you weren't feeling entirely fulfilled by what was happening in the movement. Yeah, I, I was in a group at the time, and I mean, I was, I was doing stuff that I, I, I thought was useful, but I also at the same time, it wasn't like really my, I didn't feel like I connected in terms of like the larger, what <laughs> we could achieve. In, in kind of the movement and so um, meeting Wayne and you know just sharing our, our vision of what we wanted to achieve and what we felt like we could achieve really kind of jolted us into kind of thinking about how we should form form a group ourselves and, and kind of start on our own path. Yeah. And I mean, there were just so many kind of random circumstances that happened to coalesce <coughs> in allowing me to happen to be first of all in California for Ronnie to happen to be at the restaurant at the same time for both of us to to, to be in a place where we were willing to engage in a dialogue and I mean it, it was after that that kind of, we, we never had any thought at that point that we were going to develop an animal rights platform that ultimately reached 41 cities around the world, 17 different countries around the world, um, and create national press coverage. It was just, it was just like an aspiration that we all had. We, we wanted to do something personally and fulfilling to have an impact for animals. Um, so that was kind of a big moment in the inception of Direct Action Everywhere because two people just got together who had a common vision of what they wanted to achieve. And if there's one lesson from that, it's get out there and talk to people. You know, identify people you think might have some common vision, whether it's within DXC or outside of DXC, and try to build something together. Because grassroots movements always build when people are willing to talk to each other. Uh, so that was, I think, a very important moment in kind of DXC's formation locally. The second important moment for, for me in kind of DXC's expansion around the country was when Ronnie and I and a few other folks went down to Los Angeles. And we had, I don't even remember exactly why we went down to LA. I think it was Ronnie who had a relationship with this one, Carol Glasser who is a fantastic activist in Los Angeles, and they were hosting, hosting a memorial for, for laboratory animals in Los Angeles. We thought, all right, this is going to be a good event. We're all free this weekend. Why don't we drive down? Um, we met so many incredible activists, but one of the people I met who had the most impact on me, and probably the biggest impact of anyone I met on that day, was this woman over here, Tash. And Tash was an extremely young, energetic activist, and one of the things about the animal rights movement that, that is, is true and unfortunately true is that there's so many terrible things happening to animals, and we're so kind of bombarded with negative imagery and horrible violence that so many of us just get depressed. We, we want to sit in a dark room by ourselves at home and think about how terrible the world is. We become extremely hateful towards the world, and that's not empowering. It doesn't make us want to go out and change, and it doesn't help us believe that we can achieve change and the people around us. And what struck me about TAC was she obviously was very, very concerned, and she told me about all these things she had been doing in school, at home, to work for animals, but she had this incredibly positive, kind of hopeful attitude. And she came and she was just like, oh, that was great what you guys did. I love what you're doing. I'm so glad you're here. And she just like went on and on. And I was like, whoa, who is this woman? And so the two things that I thought were really remarkable about the interaction were, first of all, that TAC had this incredibly positive, welcoming, engaging personality and perspective of animal rights activism. But second, that she was someone from another city who had seen some of the things we'd done. And we'll tell you a little bit more about some of the things we'd done. We, we, we had done uh, prior to this trip, and the, some of the things we've done since then, but I, it was really inspiring for us, all of us locally, to see that someone from Los Angeles had seen some of the videos that we'd done, because so, when we went to meet TAC, DXC had only been in existence for, I think, a month, um, or maybe two, at most, and we were just like, you know, a bunch of grass exactly, just like five people in a room, basically, got together with a laptop and said, hey, let's get, do something creative to try and provoke some awareness and provoke some consciousness for animals. Um, to see some, someone from another city excited about what we were doing was ex extremely gratifying. And as you'll see in this presentation, this idea of networks building up and self-reinforcing and inspiration and excitement kind of spreading through a social network very rapidly is, is an incredibly important part of what DXC is trying to accomplish. And Tat, you were kind of the first example of this. So I'm hoping Tat can come up here and just share oh. her experience with you. <laughs> So, of her first interaction with me. And that's all I got. You can sit down. Yeah. My first interaction. And just I, what you thought about DXC and kind of how, because immediately after we met, within a, I think a month or two, <laughs> <laughs> within a month or two, I think we met in January, I believe. Is that right? Uh, I think it was in January of 2013. And then within a couple months, in around March, during spring break, Tack and one of her friends came up to visit us because they were so excited about what we had been doing that they wanted to kind of see firsthand what happened. Was yeah, that? I can give some uh, like context. I mean, I, don't, I could go on like forever, but like, yeah, I mean, so I started kind of getting into like the whole activism thing down in Irvine, so LAH area, and I was doing like this is this kind of relevant, super like when I met you guys. Okay, so we were doing like these like actions where we like one that stuck with me the most is like we did this fur protest outside of like this fur store, and we're like standing there, and my friend Sarah and Amy 
are all like, you know, we're just gonna win them over with love, and we're just gonna be like, oh, you know, like, could you please not wear that for And they're just like, you know, like, screw you guys, like, we don't give a crap what you have to say. So, like, we're all just standing there, like, smiling, wearing our, I wasn't, but <laughs> everyone's, like, standing there wearing their dresses and be like, look how fashionable we are, like, you don't have to buy this and still look beautiful, and it's like, no, and then, like, the people are just kind of, like, dismissing us and, like, being really hostile, and, like, I come away from these things, like, feeling super unsatisfied and just, like, this isn't what I want to be doing. This isn't what I want to be saying. Like, this isn't the truth. I don't want you to still be fashionable but not be wearing an animal. Like, you need to stop doing this. So then I see these, well, I'm about to go to this um, P4S Memorial, and I see this video of, you know, Wayne and the rest of them going into a Sprouts and being like, to the grocery store. Yeah, they went into a grocery store and they were just like, they stood by the meat counter and they did their poem and then they just like, Wayne just said like, this needs to stop, like we can't do this and like it's not okay. And it was like a direct message and it was like, this is what we want to say and we're like willing to speak out what our mind is and not just be like, oh you know, like look at my dress, like I'm pretty, you can be pretty too. So, when I, and I was coming from like a place of like, I was like in a, obviously we've all been there, like I was in a really dark place of like, you know, I'm angry and I was taking it out on everyone and everything because I was angry, but like to just see these speak out and just say your mind and then when I came up to visit with Roxanne, that was, is it okay if I mentioned that that was the first time I visited Chipotle? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then I visited with Roxanne, um, but Roxanne had like different ideas about activism. But then like we just did a couple speak outs at a Chipotle and it was like, I was able to just say like what I felt, like, you know, this isn't okay and it needs to stop. Yeah. And it wasn't like this sidestepping of like, you know, like maybe just don't buy that fur today. Like, no. <laughs> and it was like super inspiring to me because like you can just let out what you're feeling and you have like that community of people. Like at first you're so nervous, you're like, oh my god, I'm like talking and I'm like yelling at these random people in the restaurant. But then like you know you have these people that are gonna like, no, like you're not alone. Like you have these people here supporting yeah. you too. And it was just like an amazing thing to like yeah. and it was have incredibly this powerful activism that wasn't to have these two LA actors come out here and so excited to join us. And TAC delivered a speak out. It was actually the first Chipotle protest we ever did. And TAC went out to the went up to the counter and just she turned around and pretended she was buying something when she got it. She actually counter. did buy She just turned yeah, yeah. <laughs> did you actually pay for it? You paid yeah, for it. Yeah, I paid for it. For and she turned months. around and said, What this restaurant is doing is not food, it's violence. I mean it's just I mean that was the, the, the essence of her message. And it was incredibly powerful for all of us because I think there's something to be said of just a straightforward, honest appeal to people's moral integrity to say that there's something fundamentally wrong about what's happening to these animals, and if you believe what we believe, which is that animals ought not be hurt, come and join us. So that was, that was awesome. And so, now I have a new family. <laughs> and now she's been with us ever since. Yeah. So, okay. Let's for the next slide. Okay, so we had, at this point, an objective. We wanted to make a big splash. We wanted to see the movement grow. We wanted to have a strong vision of the way the world ought to be. And we started collecting some people behind that vision. Well, you need an idea for how to implement it. And if there's... If there's one thing that distinguishes kind of our intellectual and strategic approach to activism, it's that we take very seriously comparisons to other social justice movements and take very seriously the idea that there's been an incredible amount of research and activism in all these other social justice movements that we need to apply to animal rights as well. And so there's a famous book by a New York Times writer and, and a very kind of insightful social critic named Adam Nagorny, um, who wrote a book called After Good about the gay liberation movement. And I remember when I read this book and I saw this line, I think it's actually in the introduction, um, I was struck, and I was struck because it, it resonated so much with the way I was feeling about the animals. And the line is, um, but it was not until homosexuals began to adopt the tactics of other, more radical movements, that the struggle for gay rights gained momentum, and quicker change began to come. And he was talking about the Stonewall riots. The Stonewall riot occurred in 1969, and it was essentially um, a riot. It was a battle between the police and, and queer people, who had, for decades, basically institutionalized, abused, thrown in prisons for who they were. And in 1969, they decided, we're not going to take this anymore. There were just a, a gathering, there was a gathering of, of queer individuals in uh, an inn called Stonewall who were raided by the police, and they said, you know what, we're not going to take this anymore. We're going to say what we believe, we're going to act out in defense of what we believe. And it spawned a movement that, over the next 30 or 40 years, changed, changed the landscape of the world. But the, the important thing that Adam McGorney pointed out was before Stonewall, it's not as if Stonewall was, was kind of the same thing that they'd been doing for 30 or 40 years and suddenly it started working. Prior to that point, the gay liberation movement, like so many liberation movements, was, was stuck in a rut. And the rut that it was stuck in was people were afraid to come out and say what they actually believed. So there's the Mattachine Society in the 1950s and 1960s that tried to kind of just educate people about 
the status of gays, try to convince people, let's not put them in prisons, let's not put them, let's not fire them, let's not murder them, let's just educate the public very slowly. And education has always been a crucial part of every social justice movement, but so is direct action. And what changed in 1969 was LGBT folks decided, all right, we're going to start taking direct action. We, we're not going to accept the fact that the world might just change one person at a time over 10,000 years. We want the world to change now. Um, and it, and after I read this book, and after I started reading about this particular movement, I, I started examining a number of different movements. And what you saw in so many of these movements was five important characteristics um, that will develop into organizing principles. The first is that all these movements were strong movements. They were not afraid to make a very, very strong statement about the rights of an oppressed class. And because they were strong, they inspired strong followings. The second is they were brave. They weren't afraid to provoke, to break social norms, to engage in civil disobedience, nonviolent direct action. And that was an important part of provoking this sort of attention and uh, public controversy that would trigger growth in the movement. And the third is that they're creative and innovative. This is an example of a, of a protest that ACT UP, a gay liberation and AIDS activism group, did in 1991. Um, and it's a dying. They basically took over an entire highway and said, you know, there, there are queer people who are dying all over this country, and this is something that everyone needs to pay attention to. We're going to stop business as usual because the world cannot go on doing what it's been doing to people who are in this community. Um, and using those sorts of creative methods, again, provoked attention, attracted controversy in a way that just kind of passively giving people information did not. Um, the third, fourth, and unfortunately this is misspelled, this is my error, is that they're extremely welcoming. So movements that grow are focused on growth. Right? That should be a straightforward, straightforward idea. But so often movements, because they're marginalized, because you feel like you're part of an oppressed class, because you're in such a small minority, you start closing yourself out to the world around you. But, Movements that are extremely successful maintain that open model, that welcoming atmosphere. And finally, they have faith in themselves. So we're going to talk about all these, um, these organizing principles. Each of these five ideas is going to develop in an organizing principle for direct action everywhere. Uh, but before we jump there, I just want to give some backdrop. I think there are conventional models of activism that have been used not only in the animal rights movement, but in many other movements for decades. Um, and the model as I can best summarize, it is set out like this. There, there are basically three different goals that we're trying to achieve as animal rights activists. One is we're trying to change the public. The, th the second is we're trying to modify corporations in some way. And the third is tr we're trying to lobby the state. So these three big classes of actors who we need to change. The public, corporations, and the state. And it's through these three that we hope to achieve change. And what I want to su suggest to you, and what I think Direct Action Everywhere is largely about, is that there's a missing step in that process. Namely, if we don't have a powerful movement that can help us reach the public, change corporations, and lobby the state, then we're not going to achieve any real and permanent effects. So, the problem with so many movements, including the animal rights movement, is while we have these, things, these, these three things happening, they're not happening in a powerful and robust enough way that the change we're achieving is permanent. So one example of this concretely is, in 2006, I was part of a campaign in Chicago that repealed the sale of foie gras. It was the first city in the country that banned the sale of foie gras on, on a city-wide scale. Within nine months, this ban was repealed. And why? Because while the activist movement managed to have a public outreach to affect corporations and lobby the state for a short period of time to change this institution, within nine months, when all the activists had gone home, when we kind of forgot about the issue, the powers that currently existed, inertial forces, reverted that change. And so we went back to the way the world was before. And if we want to achieve robust and long-term effects, we have to have a very solid base. When you think about political campaign, the first thing any political campaigner who's an expert will tell you is, you have to have a base. If you don't have a base, you don't have any hope for changing the world. And if you have a base, you can start to grow from that base to affecting the world as a whole. So there's one other thing that I forgot to put in this diagram, and that is, DXC is not only focused on movement building, as opposed to just public outreach, corporate antagonism, and lobbying. We're also using a different mechanism for affecting these three categories of, of um, social factors than most, most activist groups. I think most activist groups focus on material, economic, and physical modification of these systems. So one example of this is if we can make animal exploitation less profitable, then fewer animals will be exploited. Well, that's absolutely true. The mechanism that, with, that we are hoping to use to change these three categories of factors is ideas. And, and there's an entire blog and podcast and presentation on this subject. But what cognitive scientists and social scientists have found over the past 30 years is that ideas matter. That human beings are social animals who are an animated by stories, by, by principles, by religions. And if we can change people's ideas, if we can change the way people conceive of animals, if we can change the way people conceive of their love of animals, then we can start to change the world in a very powerful, robust, and permanent way. Okay. So, we have these five factors. Strong, brave, creative, innovative, welcoming, faith in our dreams. And we turn these five factors 
into five ways we can build a stronger movement. The first is we want to have a strong message. And the reason we have, as our first organizing principle, that we believe in total animal liberation is because we believe in the power of a strong message to build a strong movement. The second is direct action. Direct action is all about break, social bravery, legal bravery, moral bravery. Yeah, right. And if there's anything that's most notable about our activism is that we're trying to empower activists to push their own boundaries, to go into spaces where they're unwelcome and say things that shouldn't be said, but that need to be said. Third is storytelling. We want to use creative tactics, and if there's anything about a story that makes it powerful, it's that it's creative and innovative in some way. The fourth is that we focus on community. Community is, is a fertile ground on which active students grow. And finally, we believe in our dreams. We have confidence in ourselves, and we want to build that same sort of confidence in the movement as a whole. So we have, we have an idea, we have a number of people who are setting out to achieve this idea, we have a structure and a framework for, for going out to pursue that idea, the beginning. So just a brief story, the, 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 the first action we did was in a grocery store in California, and we really didn't plan it very well, we kind of had a basic idea, we decided to do a guerrilla poem, which is basically an action where a number of different activists who are planted in the environment, um, and you don't know our activists, suddenly transform into activists and deliver lines of a guerrilla poem. And the first few times we did it, it wasn't very successful. And so there was, a, there was an extensive learning process. This is actually an image from a protest we did in Portland. I think it was the fourth protest that we did. Um, but again, one of the most important elements of our approach is that we're willing to take risks, we're willing to push boundaries and be creative and fail, make some mistakes and try and get better as we went, as we go along. So this is a protest that I think did not go particularly well. It was very powerful for us who participated in it, but nonetheless, it showed that you know, we're willing to kind of push these boundaries to use creative tactics and involve people in other cities, because this is a protest that happened before. So we have this beginning. Um, and with this beginning, let's talk about the organizing principles. The first organizing principle is that we believe in and fight for animal liberation. So if there's one thing about total animal liberation, this organizing principle, that it's most important, I think it's that we want to tell people and con convince people and inspire people to say what is true and what they believe. Um, and the best example of this worldwide is an activist in Australia named Paddy Mark. And Paddy Mark is such an inspirational figure. He's been doing open rescues for decades and really established a model for activism for activists all over the world to follow. And Patty Mark is the sort of person who doesn't strike you as extraordinary in any kind of superficial way. She doesn't have any tattoos. She's not, she's not the sort of person who's extravagant or, or, or an incredible order in any way. But what she believed is that if we believe that these animals ought not be harmed, let's just go into these places of violence and take them out openly, not afraid of the consequences, not afraid of showing our faces, and not afraid of what these corporations and the state can do to us. And so for 30 years, she's been walking into these places of darkness and violence and just rescuing these animals. And the stories that have animated from her activism all over the world have inspired people in Israel, inspired people in Spain. One of my good friends in Israel, Sasha Bajor, who started the group 269 Life, has told me about how influential Patty's activism was, inspiring him to be an activist and do the activism that he's been doing. And when we had a group of activists from Spain visit us from Animal Equality, they said the same thing, that this model of activism had inspired them. And partly it's because it was such a strong message that Patty was just willing to go into these places of violence and say, Hey, you know what? If we believe these animals not ought not be harmed, let's just take them out. Let's give them the freedom that they deserve. So is there any doubt upon this? Well, um, there's, there's a wonderful quote from William Lloyd Garrison in a book called One Blood by a Berkeley professor. And the quote is, you need no more than one to begin with. Four men may, may, may rev or you need no more to begin with. Four men may revolutionize the world. And William Lloyd Garrison was was corresponding with an early anti-slavery activist. This is from the 1830s, the anti-slavery movement in the United States. And uh, an activist in, I think it was Rhode Island, Providence, wrote to him and said, I can't get anyone involved. Like, we have, you know, this message is so radical. The idea that slaves and human beings ought to be free, no matter what skin color they were, is such an extreme position in the 19th century United States that I'm afraid that I can't continue doing this. And what Garrison said is, you have to believe in the power of your message. You have to believe in the integrity of your cause. And if you believe in the integrity of your cause, you will attract the following. And, there's, and there is incredible evidence now that Garrison was right. Within a period of six years, they went from having around five or six anti-slavery groups all over the country to close to 1,300. 40,000% growth in a six-year period. Similarly, when we look at the civil rights movement or the LGBT movement, and the LGBT movement, 1969 was a date of the Stonewall rights. There were around 50 gay liberation groups around the country during that time period. Within two years, there were 2,500. If you look at the Civil Rights Movement, the first city had four activists in a Greensboro, uh, North Carolina, Woolsworth. Within two years, there were 100,000 people performing sit-ins around the world. And part of the reason for this is because when you have a strong inspirational message, it creates a strong inspirational following. 
You know, if you say like, oh, we're going to try and make a bigger cage or a better duck, there's a room for that in this movement, but it's not going to grow the movement as much as an inspirational message. So that's the first and most important element of why focusing on total animal liberation is so important. The second, though, is it provokes a response. One of the most common reasons people give for not offering a strong message is they say, people get angry at us, they're hostile at us, they don't accept what we're saying. But the thing about a belief that you think is true is if you believe it's true, you want that debate, you want that controversy. If you're confident that you can win the argument, all you have to do is get your t issue onto the table. So a big part of what we're trying to achieve with this first organizing principle is have a confident message, provoke a debate, and have the confidence you can win the debate. And the third thing is it sets us down the path to systemic change. I talked about the Fogwa ban and how this, this kind of relatively minor form that was incredibly difficult to achieve was nonetheless reversed within a year. And, and one of the reasons we keep our focus on total animal liberation is because we realize that we're operating in an environment where there are powerful institutional forces constantly pushing both in individuals and our entire society back in an animal exploiting fashion. Right? There are powerful corporations that are constantly lobbying the government, constantly bombarding consumers with advertising about how they should be eating animals, how they should be wearing fur, and all these things. And so if we don't have a strategic vision of how we can affect not just one individual, not just one corporation, not just one state, but really the entire system, cultural, moral, and economic, that encourages animal exploitation, we can't achieve real and permanent change. Okay. So now I'll move to the next uh, organizing principle, which I think my co-organizer, Chris Van Breen, is going to take over. <coughs> Second principle, it's, I don't know, they're just numbered because there's a list of them, but <laughs> there's not really any one is any more important than any other, which I'll talk about later. They're all equally important and necessary. Um, but we take and ask others to take nonviolent direct action. Um, so the idea, the difference is directly con confronting these ideas versus accommodating these ideas. So accommodating an idea would be like, saying, you know, it's better if you don't do this, but I understand if you want to, you know, or I respect that you're going to, or something like that. That's sort of like accommodating these ideas of, uh, of violence. But directly confronting the idea of violence is saying, no, it's never okay no matter what. Um, so it's the difference between a direct stance and an indirect stance. An indirect stance says, you know, like my mom asked me, she says, she said to me, well, what if, I was vegetarian five days a week. And I said, oh, well, what if I only murdered people on the weekends? <laughs> and, uh, and she was like, oh, yeah, okay, I see your point. I think I could have gotten her to be a vegetarian five days a week if I had told her that. And a lot of people will argue with me that maybe I should have done that, that, that would have been better. But I think it's really important for some people to have an incredibly direct strong message of equality for animals. And so to have that direct message that it's always wrong, this violence is always wrong, discrimination is always wrong, no matter what, that there's no room for accommodation at all. There's no room for compromise. This is about being direct and saying this is what's right. So, um, and uh, you all have the, uh, the rest of the list. list. Um, so we're going to talk about what is direct action. Um, so nonviolent direct action are techniques outside of institutionalized behavior for social change that challenges an unjust power dynamic. So what does that mean? That means there are these rules that we all live by uh, because of, uh, some of them are because of morality, but a lot of them are just social conventions. Like, it's rude to go up to someone and start swearing in their face in most circles. In other circles, it's not. So different cultures have different things which are allowed. Now, sometimes it's a, le it's a law, you know, like you're not allowed to do certain things because of a law. And that will depend on, again, where you live. And also where you live and who you're interacting with determines what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. So uh, direct action, you know, is something that's outside of institutionalized behavior. So institutionalized behavior is to eat animals, is to allow people to do, uh, is not only to allow them to do it, but to say that it's okay for them to do it. And so, again, you know, saying, um, directly confronting someone's morals is inherently rude. 
Like, when you tell someone that your morals are wrong, that's rude. That's in violation of, of, uh, of institutional behavior. And so the, the, the second part of it is, you know, different methods. Protest, non-cooperation, and intervention without the threat of violence. So, oh, this is non-violent direct action, I should say, what is non-violent direct action. And in essence, people turn to non-violent direct action after the institutionalized way of settling agreements are unsuccessful. So, when there's a problem, first you try, you know, talking to a politician, or talking to your friends, or saying, hey, you know, this is a problem, it shouldn't be like this. And if everyone's like, oh, okay, yeah, and then you're fine. You don't have to do anything really aggressive. Um, but when people refuse to have a conversation with you, when you want to go and talk to someone, and you want to say, uh, this is the way it should be, this is the way it is, and they're like, oh, you know what, I don't want to talk about that, or I, that's gross, or I don't want to listen, or whatever. So when I think that it's, it's important to first try to have that conversation. But when society at large refuses to have that conversation, we need to force that conversation. And this is, a, this is sort of the key for direct action. Direct action forces that conversation. Um, so I actually have like a little bit of an interesting story because I was opposed to direct action just a couple of years ago. And I actually argued against it with like other activists from Occupy and like other movements and I say, oh, you know, because I was an animal rights activist. I mean, when I was a child, like, and through college, I went to marches and did all these things with unions and uh, feminist movements and all these other uh, things. And, but after college, I took a break from activism for years and when I started doing activism again, it was animal rights activism. And animal rights activism, for the most part, not all of it, but for the most part was leafleting was having conversations with people, was showing people movies, and being polite to people, and saying, you know, uh, these are some small changes you can make. And, um, and education, really focusing on educating the public. And even though I've been leafleting for years, and doing pay-per-view, and showing some like, I felt like I had some small change, but really kind of a very small change. And, um, I don't know why I was so determined that direct action was wrong, that education was the way, when I hadn't really seen any results from education. But, um, but when we talked about it, uh, the main thing is, is it works, you know, why direct action, but it's in a, been an essential part of every successful social, social justice movement. And from, you know, abolition of slavery, women's suffrage, labor rights, civil rights, the list goes on and on. Like, Every successful social justice movement has had uh, direct action, nonviolent, open, and above ground direct action as a major part of the campaign. There have been other things going on. There have been lobbyists and leafleters and moderates, but this was one thing that um, we felt that the animal liberation movement was lacking because animal liberation movement has lobbyists has leafleters, has moderates, has underground act, uh, direct action. But what we felt that we were missing was a very strong, open and above ground direct action uh, movement. There were some people like Patty Mark who are doing open and above ground direct action. Uh, but we felt that it was not a large movement. So what we really wanted to build this movement on, so this is why uh, we chose this as an organizing principle. And why nonviolence? So that's why direct action, direct action works. Why nonviolence? Well, we stand for the values of life, compassion, love, and respect for other beings. And you know, we want to demonstrate those values in our actions. And some of us just believe that nonviolence is the way it should be. And some of us just believe it's a really, really good tactic. But um, all of us agree that what we want is a world without violence, a world without discrimination, and you cannot use um, the tools of uh, violence to get rid of violence. And so, the, basically, the means need to be in line with the ends. So that's why we say nonviolence. First, I'll read a quote from Cesar Chavez. Uh, nonviolence is not inaction. It is not discussion. 
It is not for the timid or weak. Nonviolence is hard work. It is the willingness to sacrifice and the patience to win. Um, so Cesar Chavez was sort of a hero in my family for uh, since before I was born. I've had aunts and uncles that uh, worked with and marched with him, the farm workers. Um, a lot of my family and my mom's side were farm workers, uh, you know, a few generations ago. And so, uh, so he's a very inspirational figure to me. And uh, you know, the things that he did, he was not what you would normally think of. He was not like super charismatic. He was not like a totally outgoing person. But he was a person who was very solid, very determined, and very passionate. Um, and you knew that he just believed that you could win, that we could win uh, with the things that he was doing. And so he inspired a lot of people and grew communities. Um, and uh, someone that he looked up to as well was Martin Luther King Jr. And a letter from a Birmingham jail is something I recommend everyone read. I've had a lot of criticisms from a lot of people that I felt like, well, if you read this letter, this would deal with your criticisms, but nonviolent direct action seeks to create a crisis and foster such a tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks so to dramatize the issue that it can no longer be ignored. Another thing he said, and I'm going to misquote it because that's what I do, is <laughs> he said that there's this tension that's already there. There's already a tension there. What we're doing is bringing that tension up to the surface and not allowing you to ignore it. So there's already all of this violence, these atrocities are going on every day. So we're not causing these atrocities. We're, uh, we're trying to like, bring these up to the surface. So there's already this tension there. There's already like, mass you know, discomfort to not even the word for it. But people say, you're making a, people uncomfortable, and that's not good. It's like, I don't want to make people uncomfortable but I want to stop atrocity. And that's, that's why we say direct action. Um, and like I said, all of our organizing principles, they're all interrelated. They're, none of them really work without any of the others. So without animal liberation, animal liberation is the need, is our message for direct, for direct action. So every direct action needs a strong message. Otherwise, it's not really direct action. Um, and uh, the style of, or use is storytelling. So storytelling is a principle of ours, and a really great way of telling stories is with direct action. So um, having these stories of, there's two parts of that, I think. One part is you know, having someone tell you that violence is always wrong, no matter what. And that's, if that's a shock to you, you might tell someone about it, but having you know, a demonstration done inside of a restaurant where you are not expecting it, that's also a shock. So what we want is people to be talking about animal rights. People need to be discussing it. And even if they're, and actually, definitely if they're arguing with us, the worst enemy is of someone who is passive and doesn't argue, because if they never argue with you, you can't ever change their opinion. But people who argue with you, you can engage and talk to them about these issues. Community, direct action is both a means for building community and reliant on the community. So when we do these actions and we post them online and these stories are told, we, we get people from around the world sending us support and sometimes doing these actions. Uh, that first Chipotle action that TAC did, uh, that we all did together, that uh, TAC did to speak out for, we made this handmade sign um, and this person who was not an activist at all, I think she was a politician in the middle of the country somewhere, she saw this, act, this video that we posted, she was like, that's wonderful, I'm so enthusiastic about what she did, but you need better signs. That sign is like, <laughs> this handmade sign, you know, I felt like we worked really hard on that, and I, I didn't do any of the artwork, so it actually looked good. And, um, <laughs> But she gave us $500 so that we can wow. make these signs. Wow. And so, um, you know, so direct action as a way of like uh, building community. And so. It was like in rural Illinois, too. 
Yeah, so, um, just saw stuff on Facebook and was like, oh, that's awesome. You need, but you need better signs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so, uh, so direct action is a means of building community. Because community is anyone who's supporting us. You know, you don't have to be an activist. You don't have to get into people's faces in order to be part of the community. To be part of the community, you have to be supportive of animal liberation and supportive of us as activists. And that's, that's something that's really important to us. So that's how uh, direct action relies on the community. Because it's hard work, and it's hard to go out and have people yell at you and have people say, you know, get the fuck out of here and stop talking about that and you're rude and whatever. Nobody likes really getting yelled at. I don't like getting yelled at. And what's more importantly is even more difficult, talking to our coworkers, our friends, and our family. That's where we have the biggest impact. We really need to talk to our friends and family honestly about these issues, about all issues of violence and discrimination. And it's really hard to do. So when you have a community who supports you and loves you, and I'm getting teary, because <laughs> like I, it's the people in this room now that I love that give me support to talk to my family. Because my family doesn't want to hear it. Um, but I know that you know, no matter what they say, they don't want to hang out with me, they don't respond to my texts or, or whatever. I have another family here that supports me. And so that's really needed. Can you give me a tug real quick? <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, so all of these things are necessary. The last one is dreaming big. So if I did not have the confidence that we could change, this world in our lifetimes, I would not be going out there doing these things. So this is, I think, the, another big difference, is that like, we, we really need that confidence in order to say that we are going to change the world. Not we can change the world, not we might change the world, but we are going to change the world, and we're going to do it in our lifetimes. And that is what allows me to get up there and do direct action. Storytelling. Thanks, guys. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Sorry, let me get a drink of water. Mm -hmm. I should have so, thank you to Wayne, Chris, and Pat for coming and speaking before me and showing me what to do properly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to try and live up to that. Oh, no, what did I do? <laughs> I'm failing at it. <laughs> <laughs> so you just press the button. Sure. Okay. So, um, as Wayne mentioned earlier, my name is Ronnie, and um, I'm one of the founding organizers of Direct Action Everywhere. And so, um, our, before I get into you know what the third organizing principle is, um, I just want to give a, a, a short backstory. Um, so, a couple of years ago, we were sitting down to discuss the vision of what we wanted direct what would later become direct action everywhere. And um, we were in Wayne's small and hardly furnished Palo Alto apartment, which I often refer to as a Spartan period. Um, and we began thinking, uh, you know, what inspires people to act? Um, how do we understand the world around us? How can we effectively tell the world that about the atrocities that are happening to other animals and get them to see it as violence against individual beings, um, as something that needs to stop? And so, you know, after mulling, around, uh, mulling over these questions for some time, uh, one idea that kept coming back to us was that stories are powerful. And we thought, you know, about our own lives and, and how... We thought about our own lives and how um, we have been influenced over time and how most of these instances involve some, some kind of storytelling, um, whether it came in the form of like a novel or a film or a song or a news article, um, or simply as stories um, that we have heard from people we have met over time. And so after, you know, batting around some ideas, we, we all eventually agreed that, um, that storytelling had to be an essential component to, to our approach. And we had to figure out um, how to harness the power of stories in order to inspire others to take take action in name of, uh, in name of justice as they in, had inspired us. So in result, um, our third organizing principle came into being. This is a little picture of some weird centaur looking guy <laughs> reading to a bunch of other creatures. Well, I thought that was us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, oh, did you just put this in one? No. Yeah. Okay. 
that is expected. Sorry. Um, so our third organizing principle is we tell stories to inspire. We tell stories from the animal's perspectives. Stories to radicalize. Stories to move people. Stories to change the world. And so beyond the intuitive sense that we had in these initial discussions about how important stories are to us, um, there are a couple of compelling reasons why we should not only think about storytelling in our advocacy efforts, but how it should be central to our focus if we are going to be effective in those efforts. So before I go any further, we should discuss um, you know, what a story actually is. And so um, according to pioneering cognitive scientist and artificial intelligence theorist Ro Robert Sh or Roger Shank, along with uh, Tamara Berman, um, they say that a story is a structured, coherent retelling of an experience or a fictional account of an experience. So what is important to highlight in this is that stories have some sort of structure and that they're generally coherent in terms of chronology and space, um, the characters and actors that are involved, etc. And so when we tell stories, and whether they be to other people or stories we tell ourselves, is that we create some sense of order. So lived experience, as I'm sure we all know, is made up of very um, many random and chaotic components. And, but we begin making sense of it by ordering it into a narrative structure. Um, and so, as, and as I'm sure that we all know, that not all stories are good. And so, <laughs> as, as you know, we've all experienced. But um, they, uh, Roger Shank and, and Berman, they, they identify a couple elements that are kind of in every satisfying story. And one, one of these includes a theme, you know, which, which can be seen as kind of the organizing structure of an event or the overall lesson to be learned. Um, there's also goals, what is trying to be achieved. Um, there's plans, how to achieve these goals. Then there's expectations, how we, how we think these plans will pan out in, the, in terms of uh, goal achievement. And then there's expectation failures or obstacles. These are uh, an event that gets in the way of achieving the goal. And then finally, there's some sort of explanation or solution for why all these things have come together. And so, um, Schenk and Berman, they also explain that all stories are intended to teach or to convey something to the listener. And sometimes the listener is just ourselves when we tell the story about ourselves um, in our head. Um, and so therefore, one thing to keep in mind when we think about this process is that every story has a point or a reason for being told. Um, the point can be direct, like a moral of the story, like, you know, like, and that's why you shouldn't stick your finger in a light socket, you know, sometimes. <laughs> um, or it, sometimes it can be indirect, such as um, when we intend to convey to the listener that, oh, we're funny, like that story I just told that was funny all <laughs> <laughs> and so, or that we're knowledgeable, or that we simply were interested in similar topics. And so, sometimes the reason for telling a story can be to convey that we simply just enjoy conversing about a subject, and that we, we continue to tell stories that are thematically connected, like back and forth in conversation, um, to continue the conversation. You know, conversations usually don't jump around from topic to topic to topic to topic. You know, they, they generally have some sort of coherence in their, their themes, and which is why it becomes a conversation. And so, but whether or not, you know, our points or reasons are actually understood by the listener, the, the utterance or the act of storytelling is still meant to inform on some level. So, um, and I, I urge you to look at some of these quotes because I'm not going to actually read them all too. Um, besides knowing the elements that go into producing stories, which we often do at kind of an unconscious level in conversation or when telling stories to or about ourselves, um, I come to... The first point in my presentation, is everybody done reading those? No? Okay. It's not it's extremely vital, but... Um, my first point is that we use stories to understand and remember the world around us. So again, Schenck and Berman indicate that our memories are complex groupings of similar features that serve as story indexes. Uh, when, we experiencing some, when we experience something, like we are right now in this room, um, at this meeting, there is an, an incomprehensible amount of, like, of stimuli that goes into our experience. There are so many different faces in the room, um, there's types and colors of, of dress, there's textures, smells, words, sounds, ideas, feelings, and on and on. And so, and these are all, you know, impossible to be consciously aware of, um, let alone being able to remember. So, we must pull apart like certain features and, and index or store these experiences which get categorized with other experiences that we've had and then we form a general story in our memories of you know what going to open meeting at the direct action Everywhere house is like or you know what 
what going to a restaurant is like. You know, and so when we go, we kind of have these expectations of what's going to happen. Um, and if we didn't do that, we would have a lot of trouble navigating our daily lives. So, you know, forming steps to, or sorry, forming stories helps us to use our minds efficiently. So that, for example, every time we enter a restaurant, we don't have to figure out how to convince somebody to feed us. Uh, and we use, we use a, a general story that has been created from an amalgam or a, co a compilation of other restaurant experiences and stories from other sources that we've integrated into our memory banks to formulate a plan that is going to be congruent with the expectations and in the end reach our goal of obtaining food. Um, so, apart from, apart from these... So apart from these cognitive details, you know, why are stories so fundamental um, to comprehension and memory formation? Well, I'm sorry to be a disappointment, but uh, it, it's still quite a mystery why stories and narratives are so easy for us to comprehend and, and remember. Um, according to psychologists, I'm probably going to butcher their names, Grice, Greisier, Old, and Kaletka, um, they say that researchers have not yet provided a satisfying answer to the questions of why narrative has such a privileged status in the cognitive system. And by a privileged status, um, what these psychologists mean is that we process much quicker and also store narratives at a much higher capacity than we do other forms of information. So a study that they have done shows that um, narrative text is recalled um, approximately twice as well as expository text, you know, like an essay form, um, and is read uh, approximately twice as fast. So not only is there there's higher comprehension, but there's also a more efficient, uh, efficient way of comprehending. Um, and so furthermore, a study conducted by psychologist Nancy Pennington and Wayne Hasty shows that, and I'm sure Wayne can explain this a little more since he's done training the law, is that uh, a, co a coherent explanatory story has a more robust impact on the decisions of a jury than any other variable, model, or mechanism that they tested. And other researchers have showed um, similar conclusions, which like Kuhn, Weinstock, and Flatten have also showed that, um, that a coherent story sometimes has a greater impact than even the quality of evidence that is given. But regardless of exactly why narrative comprehension and remembering prevail over other forms of cognitive understanding, stories have been with us as, as long as language has existed. As far as evidence permits, storytelling has been an indispensable mode of transmitting information and experience among humans. Uh, before the invention of print and writing, stories were the primary form of dissemination of knowledge, and cognitive neuroscientist David Rubin remarks that the wisdom of cultures was passed from generation to generation through stories for several millennia. And so by all appearances, um, narrative and storytelling seem to be hardwired into, into our beings. So this brings me to my second point. Since storytelling is so fundamental to how we interact with the world, it is only logical that stories have an extremely powerful impact in shaping our individual and collective identities, beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors. As activists, our goals in the end are to influence behaviors of people and cultural relations so that they are arranged in ways that we perceive as more ethical and just. Um, and one way of affecting behavior is to affect the foundational core of, of, that these behaviors are built on, identity, beliefs, and attitudes. Um, and through the telling of stories in our activism, we hope that people will incorporate the, value, the values expressed into their own sense of identity and beliefs, and in turn be motivated to do activism um, themselves and work towards a common goal for the greater good. And so when we think about identity, we usually see it as a, a relatively stable concept that is kind of essential to our being, it's part of our essence. But as you may have guessed, identities are, are just what cultural theorists and sociologists uh, Stuart, Har Har sorry, Stuart Hall calls a narrative of the self. Hall notes that identity is a story that we tell about the self in order to know who we are. So as I've mentioned previously, Lived experience is often random and hard to categorize, so telling stories helps us to, make, to order, to make sense and meaning out of these experiences, or these occurrences. Um, and as uh, sociologist Ro Ronald Jacobs explains, these stories are not optional extras uh, used to pass time during the moments of rest and reflection. Rather, they're a central component to social life. And the same goes with collective identities, too. 
Collective identities function in many of the same ways as, in, as individual identity formation, and again, is a narrative process. It's a storytelling process. And so collective identities and personal identity are inextricably bound together. Individuals depend on the existence of shared stories to express their sense of self. For example, whatever nation someone lives in, um, they often see the nation as essential to their identity. And in defining herself, Jacobs writes, a woman might identify as a daughter, as a mother, as a feminist, a New Yorker, an American. And um, these, these group stories are, are nearly endless. So the, the main point that I, that I wish to get at by discussing the role of identity and the importance of stories more generally is that through telling stories, and telling them in particularly powerful ways, is that we hope that people will be moved emotionally and cognitively to start thinking about the lives of other animals, their perspectives, and our relation to them, in a way that the culture of speciesism has largely prevented us from doing. So, and part of the approach that we were taking to help, um, to help integrate these stories, sorry, and part of the approach we were taking is to help integrate these stories into a, a larger narrative about our collective identity as animals. And I should reiterate that we are, in fact, animals, um, which that, that point came, seems to get lost a lot. And, but we, we eventually want to see ourselves as this, our collective identity as animals and eventually see ourselves as part of, all part of the same struggle in life. And you know, all violence and atrocities committed against other animals are violence and atrocities committed to our fellow Earthlings. Um, and it is our duty to speak out against it. And so this is one of the, the banners that, I think, did you make this, Heather? Okay. Or Kelly made it. Um, that it, it shows that we all have these common features with other animals. You know, there's a human eye. I can't even identify the other animals in some of those. That's that Chimpanzee, eye. dolphin, rooster, cow, and cat. Yeah. And, <laughs> And so we, we, we're trying to establish this, this, this bigger narrative that, we're, that we are all part of this, 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 this life together and that it is kind of our duty to, 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 um, to stand up for those who are in trouble and who are experiencing threats from, from the nature of their, their existence as they're seeing now. So um, I just wanted to mention briefly some ways that we have, how we have implemented storytelling. In our February um, action, um, we came up with this concept um, to, to use these postcards that we were going to hand out inside of Chipotle's and hang out in, at various places um, that, that showed an individual animal that, whom we have met or whom we have known their, who we know their stories of to try to show their perspective. And so on the front of the card, we have a picture of the individual, like this one's Theodore and, and this one's Gloria. And then on the back, I'm not sure if you can read it, but it tells their story a little bit. And it uses, and it uses um, kind of a, a first person of, of what their perspective would be the, of them going through these things. These aren't, these, these aren't I mean, these are, these are situations that they were actually in that actually happened to them. And so we use these brief stories to help people try to understand their perspectives and help them to connect um, and see these, these as individual beings and not just kind of as food or, you know, clothing or whatever. Um, and so, and, and another way that, I, you're going to talk about community, right? Uh, um, another way that we also implement our, our storytelling is, is kind of our, about community and community building. We want to build this community of activists and we want to all feel kind of a part, to be a, be a part of the same struggle. And Kelly's going to talk a little bit more about community in that aspect, but I just wanted to make a point that it, it, it is a narrative, it is a story that we tell, that we tell ourselves, that we tell each other, and we want to kind of create that story that is welcoming and to, to kind of grow this movement in a, in, in a very positive way. And so just to go back to the organizing principles, you know, we tell stories to inspire. And the two points that I, I wanted to, to make is that we use stories to understand and remember the world around us. It's essential to the way we exist. Um, if we didn't have stories, we would not be, we would not be the people that we are. And if, and two is that stories have an extremely powerful impact in shaping our individual and collective identities, beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors. And it's through the power of stories that we can we can help foment the change um, for the for the better. Thanks. Thank you, Ronnie. Um, so our fourth principle is community, and Chris already 
touched on this beautifully. And speaking of identity, actually, identity is how we create a sense of sorry. <laughs> identity is how we um, how we create a sense of belonging to other people. We create. Oh, <laughs> We construct certain identities based, you know, a lot of the time we do it through the consumers, the brands that we choose to buy from, the kinds of the style of clothes we wear, the things that we're into, food we eat, whatever. We construct these identities so that we can feel a sense of belonging with other people, so that we can feel like we matter. Um, and by the same token, community is, communities are held together by those identities, right? You have communities of people who identify as Democrat or Republican or anarchist or animal liberationist. Um, I'm just going to read the principle because it makes some important points. We are a community. We believe in the power of friendship and community, of social support and companionship, and of virtuous cycles and memes. We believe in the wisdom of crowds and in the spontaneous creativity of the masses. We are going viral and we won't stop until all the animals are free. Um, so humans are very social animals and that's really easy to see even just in our physiological need for companionship when we feel really lonely, our health deteriorates, we become psychologically unstable, and when we're in groups of people, when we feel loved and welcomed and acknowledged and like we're part of something, then we are a lot healthier and we're a lot more productive and our lives are just a lot more fulfilled and you can see that in our neurochemical uh, responses to being around the people we love, you can see it in our heart rate, you can see it really clearly that humans are just social animals, we need to be with other people, other human people or non-human people, right? Whether it's, you know, our best human friends or the dog companions in our homes, we just, like, need to be around other people. Um, because we have this sense of belonging when we come into a group. So we want to build a really strong community that gives people, that gives animal rights activists, liberationists, however you want to identify, this strong sense of I am part of this group of people who really care about this thing that I do, and if the most important thing to us is something we all share, then it's really easy for us to all like hold together. Now that might not track for something like, you know, just if we're just a vegan group, because then people can be vegans for all sorts of reasons, and it's not necessarily that something really important to us is something we share, like maybe I'm a consumer vegan because I care about my health, or maybe or like just a dietary vegan or whatever, right? Um, but whatever consumer behaviors are, if we all care, if we all think that the animals deserve to be free and have a right to be free and we want to fight for them to be free, that's a really important value that we all share and that's just, that's just a really easy thing to come together on. And we think that this movement needs more um, of this emphasis on community instead of just like, okay, you know, we're going to set up a protest and whoever comes, comes. It should be like, no, we should have events to like get together and like be able to support each other and know that we're here for each other and to empower each other. Because like Chris was saying, you know, it can be really hard if you're in your community that you're suddenly feeling isolated from because you realize that you're thinking so differently from everybody you've grown up with, everybody you suddenly realize is, is participating in these really, these hate crimes against these other beings who are effectively our friends, who are our family members, um, and that can feel really isolating. So having a family, just like, whether, you know, whether these family members come out and do actions with us, or whether they, you know, just like, eat good food with us, and like, talk to us, and like, support us, and tell us that like, they love what we're doing, and that they support us, even if, you know, masses and the crowds are like, yelling at us and saying really hateful things about the little piglets, um, it just, it just keeps us going to have this support group. And you get burnout if you don't, right? Like if you're just, if, if I were to do the kind of actions that we do just on my own and just get up and go out with signs and like do speak outs and like I just hear nothing but people being hateful to me or people ignoring me and I didn't have anybody to come home to saying like, I'm really proud of you if I didn't have other people being like, yeah, I'm inspired and I feel empowered. If I didn't have that community, like I'd be burned out in no time, right? Like. I wouldn't be able to hold that up for very long. Um, it's very important to note that knowledge, ideas, and emotions and behaviors spread through our social ties. And that's really easy to see just when, like, you know, someone you know is, like, in a really negative mood and they're just being, like, really cynical and pessimistic. Like, it's really easy for that to happen to you, too. And it's the same with the other way around. So we can create a community of people being really positive and hopeful and just fighting for this and always supporting each other and like always thinking of the future and always thinking ahead and always thinking about what can we do to set the animals free. 
and that's going to like keep empowering us and that idea and that belief and that hope is just going to spread through everyone who we have these close relationships with and who we build these close relationships with. So as far as movement building goes, um, we have this space, this, we didn't actually introduce the space, this is an um, animal rights friendly space. We don't conceive of this just as the apartment of the people who live here. It's a space for anyone who believes that the animals should be free, anyone who believes in justice and equality and in anti all discrimination, which was just to say anti discrimination. <laughs> um, that this is a safe space for you to come and know that there are other people who, while currently the minority of the human population, like really believe what you do and are here for you and are going to fight alongside you. Um, and this has been important in other movements. If anyone knows the group ACT UP, like they have this great community space and community building, which is really important for the current LGBT movement um, that is trying to battle institutionalized heterosexism. And we want to follow that model because it just makes people so much stronger when we're fighting together. Um, this one quote that Wayne directed me to I think is very important. Varying collective identities proxied by diverse organizational memberships predicted defection of participants from the movement. Uh, this was referring to a Dutch movement. So what this means is that when you have a group of people who like are just splintered in the things that we think too much, then like you don't really have this strong sense of community and it's going to fall apart and people decide not to do activism anymore, right? They got burnt out because they weren't getting enough support. So per um, the other four organizing principles, we use community to embolden and maintain everybody's anti-species position, right? Because if I was all on my own, then it's really easy to see how someone all on their own who like might be like really like fervently anti-species and if nobody's supporting them, and if all the people they know are just participating in these hateful actions against these other beings, then you know it's not hard to see how somebody could just like fall out of it and just be like, I can't do this. This is like. I mean, it's just me against the world, like this isn't going to get me anywhere, and it's just burning out, it's just depressing, it's exhausting. They're not going to be able to set the animals free on their own. But if we can come together and we have each other's support, then it makes it a lot easier. Our friend Glenn in Chicago was just assaulted at the last action, um, and he was telling me how that, like, it made him feel, like, pretty disempowered, because, like, all he was seeing was these people being, like, really hateful and, like, like so hateful to the animals that they had to justify their hate crimes against the animals by hurting someone who was saying, please don't hurt the animals, right? Like, and it's it, because uh, the Chicago group right now is just a few people who just like really have the guts to just get out there on their own. Um, that comes at a bit of a cost, right? Because they might not feel as much support if it's just a few of them. And like, it looks great and it's so inspiring to just see just a few people just getting out there. But at the same time, like, if they don't have that much community support, then it's harder. So for activists like Glenn and everyone in Chicago, everyone in the many cities we have who are just a few people who just, like, have the guts to get out and go on their own, it's really important for them to know that even if we're not physically right there, we're here and we support them and we're going to share their stuff and we're going to, like, talk to them after their actions and, like, guide them through whatever they need and just, like, be here for them because they're going to just get burnt out if we're not. Um, community also uh, helps us encourage each other's hope in the liberationist stream. Like I was saying, if you're just around really negative people, you're more likely to be negative. But if we can keep being positive with each other and just like keep telling each other that we are going to achieve liberation, then we're going to believe it and we're going to achieve it. Pretty simple idea. <laughs> um, having community also makes it a lot easier for us to take direct action together. We have a lot of activists in our group who were like really hesitant and shy at first and didn't like want to go inside the stores and do a disruption but like after a few times because there are so many of us doing it and everyone else is just like so excited about it and feels so empowered after they do it they're like yeah I'm gonna go in too and it's great it's just like it's just that's like the best for me is when when I see someone being like yeah okay okay I can do this right and they do that because we have this community of people supporting them and saying yes you can do this and you know like if you don't have to that's cool too like you're here supporting us and we're going to support you doing whatever you want to do and I think that's also like really part of it because it's not like we're like you know you can't be in this community unless you do these specific things right like that's not how you create a strong community you're here because you believe in animal liberation however you want to fight for that it's cool with us just 
be a part of our community and let's grow this movement. Um, and as for storytelling, the community we're building and the movement we're building actually is our own story. We're trying to write our own story. We're trying to write this, you know, like one of these stories that we love in our favorite movies about this band of people just like getting together and going up against the big guy and we're going to create a big movement and we're going to make the world a better place. <laughs> and that's like, it's a powerful story and it's really motivating to us because we're not just like here kind of doing something like we think about this story of, of how the world is going to tell the story of animal liberation and we want to be part of that story. We want the history books to say like, these people were here at this time, and they started this, and they did this, and they made these waves happen. And it makes us feel really important to be part of that story. And that was my bit on community. Happy brain. Thank you, Karen. All right, everybody. Um, so I'm a dreamer, so I chose, uh, Heather and I both chose to uh, uh, talk about our last but not least organizing principle, um, dreaming big. And I really like this image of this little little guy right here looking up at the stars. He can't even look up all the way, but he tries and, and it's really, really inspiring. So, um, you know, why, why dream big and what does it mean to dream big? And um, for us, in this context, obviously, uh, dreaming big means, you know, we don't want like a better world for the animals. We want a world, uh, the best possible world for all animals. We want a world which is just. We want a world where equality and justice is the social norm. And that's exactly what we're going to work towards. So um, just two quotes, um, impossible is nothing. And, um, you know, I, I really believe in the self. Is if we don't believe in ourselves, why would anybody else? If you don't believe in your own visions, um, then, you know, how can you expect the the you know, rest of the world to follow that vision. Um, so you know, dreaming big means to have the courage and conviction to make our visions of animal liberation a reality. Dreaming big means to work towards the best possible outcome and you know, go for it and, and run with it. Dreaming big means transcending social barriers and, and believing in the power of good. Dreaming big means believing in the power of justice, Dreaming big means believing the power of equality and believing that you know one day we are going to create a world where justice, equality, and freedom are the social norm, despite of what anybody says, um, despite of the people who think that you know our vision is, is not going to happen is is not you know possible. Um, so so that's what it means to dream big, and um, Heather is going to make our first point. So I should probably go with this. All right. So wait, that's, that's the next slide? That's, okay, let's see. That's my slide. Okay, sorry. Um, so the kind of dream we're talking about, obviously, is it's like a vision. We're not talking about the dream that you dream when you're sleeping and there's a bunch of weird symbols and you don't remember it. <laughs> um, so we're talking about something that you would sit and think about and that would help motivate you. Um, there's something called creative visualization, and um, it refers to the practice of seeking to affect the outer world by changing one's thoughts and expectations. And it's a basic technique underlying positive thinking, which was really important. And it is a technique of using one's imagination to visualize specific behaviors. Now, this technique is often used by athletes and uh, like movie stars and celebrities, and touted by self-help gurus. Um, but, um, and it's also used in some forms of meditation. Um, however, the underlying reason that it may work is because of the positive energy that it creates. And this is, this is an example of somebody who used creative visualization. Um, an example is the actor Jim Carrey, who wrote himself a check in 1987 in the sum of $10 million. <laughs> he dated it Thanksgiving 1995 and added the notation for acting services rendered. He visualized it for years, and in 1994, he received $10 million for his role. Yes, he received $10 million for his role in, guess what, Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> totally <laughs> worth it. <laughs> Do I believe that the universe magically handed him success because he visualized or dreamed about it day in and day out, like some of these self-help things tell you? No, I don't. 
I believe he attained this goal because his dream inspired him to never give up, because his dream gave him confidence and belief in himself that when he was thinking about it every single day, that it would keep him from giving up because he saw what he wanted, what meant so much to him, and he refused to settle for less. And that's one of the things Priya touched on. In our dream, we dream about a world that animals are free, and we do not dream about anything less than that. And that's what keeps us motivated and keeps us focused. For us, visualizing is even more important because there is more than our own desires at stake. At stake. Um, dreams or vision, dreams or visions, like like we're talking about, are a type of visualization. We take our imagination and we go there and see what it's like, see what it's like to feel to be there, and that's what keeps us going. Um, um, okay. The type, the dream we hold, and this is so important, is the one where we imagine ourselves in a world where all animals are living free from fear and pain, as they should be. And when I think about it, it keeps me coming back here week after week. Um, Kelly was talking about, you know, how you, all of the horrors that, that, that we face all the time. Well, actually, all of the, all of the organizers were talking about this, that there's, there's so many obstacles, like all the things you see on Facebook every day and all the things you hear from other people. And, and there's a real danger of becoming depressed or upset and wanting to just, like, on a hole and, and not come back here. Um, and that could have easily happened to me. Um, it would have been really easy for me to say, you know, how can we ever change this? You know, I mean, there are days I just cry. And there's day, and I've talked to Priya about it, there's days she's cried. We, we all have those days. Um, and it would be easy to say, you know, well, not participating in the participating in the violence is enough. It would be easy to say it's enough just to be vegan, you know, just not to participate in the violence. If I thought our goals were too lofty and unattainable, if I thought that I could never make a difference, I might not be coming back here. But I discovered when I first started coming to DXC the way that I could never feel defeated. And that was to tell myself, no matter what people say, no matter what obstacles are bombarding us daily, this will happen, and I can see it, I will see it. And that is what keeps me going. It is the main reason, one of the main reasons I was drawn to DXC. My, my very first action at DXC was one of our most, um, it was the biggest, crowd of people that we had to stand up in front of, and one of the ones where we had the most opposition, it was the, um, the ac action, it was a disruption we did at the, the Cultivate Festival in Golden Gate Park, and there were 200 people sitting there, and there was about maybe 15 or 20 of us, and it was loud, and people were booing, and they were yelling at us, but I just kept thinking about, I don't care what they say, I don't care what you know, how big this is against us, I don't care how, how many times people are threatening us. I see this world and I'm not, and I'm going to stand up here and I'm just going to look back at them and go, I see this world and this is what's going to happen. And that's what kept me from not, I wasn't even nervous, I couldn't believe it. No. Um, me, who's, I'm nervous right now, I'm always <laughs> about being up in front of people and it's been a big problem for me, but I wasn't nervous that day because that, that thing was so important to me and I had never even thought about it that way before. Just put it all out of your mind and see that dream. And that's what made me not nervous and do that. And it was scary. Um, and it, was, it got even scarier, so uh, it's a good thing I was able to keep that in mind. Um, and that's what keeps me coming back here. That's, that's what got me started coming and that's what made me want to be involved in this and stay involved in this. And that's what keeps me coming back here. All right. Thanks, Heather. So, um, okay, so basically, the second point that I want to make is that, you know, dreaming big uh, motivates us to take action. And, you know, that's, that's obvious enough, but it's the way that having, like, a, a very strong vision keeps you motivated and that's you know in an optimistic way it's in a very profound way and it's in a very sustainable way so 
just as, a, as an example, looking back at you know really great leaders such as Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King, these people have very very like you know co complex but well simple but in a way like very strong visions of the kind of world they wanted. Um, and if we just like look at Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King, they urged people to take action, which was not just like oh like let's just get up and go out there and like march you know maybe this will happen like maybe we'll see India is like free like let's just go out like hang out let's just do it let's see what happens no <laughs> they were like you know they, they they were very very convinced in their own dream and they they didn't think twice they said this is going to happen they didn't look at it as an option you know if you imagine like put yourself in Mahatma Gandhi's perspective he had this sense of urgency and he was like no I want to see this country as, as being like a free country, and I'm going to make it happen. And that's how somebody like him and Martin Luther King motivated people to get out there and, you know, basically convince people that we are going to sit here and like let people, we're going to take a beating. I mean, that is such a very difficult thing to ask people to do. Um, and how do you do that? And that's by having like a very strong vision. You can't do that without having a strong vision. And that translates to all of us here. Um, you know, if we can't, you know, if we if we don't believe that animal liberation is possible, then like, why even bother taking the direct action? Um, and so, just one one example that you know I wanted to give as far as our our, our group here is, I remember um, in August we were all we were you know we weren't doing as much, and then all of a sudden um, we heard about the Earthlings March, and we had three weeks, and I just remember I just remember Wayne being like, all right, well let's make it happen, and I was kind of like. What, what? Like, what are we trying to make happen? I mean, uh, March? Yeah, sure, we'll get like 20 people. <laughs> seriously, I mean, I, I, I seriously thought that. And then guess what? You know, next thing you know, fast forward three weeks, we have 41 cities on board, and most of the work, you know, we, have, we had a lot of help from um, uh, 269 and, you know, Sasha from Israel, but seriously, most of the work we did. We were a new group. We did not really have that many core members. I think Heather and Kelly came on board um, you know, in part because of that, because of the Earthlings Coalition, but, you know, we made it happen, and if, if it wasn't for, like, our vision of, you know, okay, we, the sense of urgency and, you know, this, this uh, feeling of, well, we have to do this, of course we have to do this, we have to do this for the animals, and we don't, we're not just going to do it because we think, like, oh, yeah, this is, like, it might work, no, we, we, wanted, we wanted to do it, we wanted to do it right, and um, we had, I don't know the exact count, but I think it was, like, 160 people at our own at our own uh, march in San Francisco, and you know, just when I look back on it, it's just surreal. Like we had less than three weeks to do it, and like I actually have thought about this before. Sometimes, like before I go to sleep, I'm like, isn't that weird? How you know, somehow we just met Kelly, who's like a really great person. Uh, Kelly and Heather, who you know, worked on um, uh, our the graphic design and, and made the the shirts that you know you see up here that we're all Earthlings United for Animal Liberation. How strange! We just met. We just met them, and you know, we, we it's because we wanted it. We like we were like we we gotta make this happen. We want the best, and they sensed that. You know, they came in, plugged themselves in, and voila! Like we have we have everything, and it worked out. So that's one example. And and even when we do our actions for um, our it's not food, it's violence campaign, the first action we did, you know, we had a we had a small group of cities from other countries and uh, other cities around. The United States join us, but now, now we have. Uh, I think in total we've had 36. Wayne, 37. Uh, 37 cities join us, um, and it's because it's because we have this vision, um, and you know when and when we ask people to join our actions, they see that vision as well. And you know if it wasn't for this big dream and like and 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 presenting to others like you know, that we need to make this happen, I, I doubt that we would we would have this much success, but. Because we, we are confident, because we are courageous, because we are brave, um, other people are also appealed to that. So, um, you know, Dreaming Big motivates us, ourselves, but it also, like, inspires other people to take action. So those are just two examples. And I'll just uh, move on to the, the third point, which is Dreaming Big helps us stay focused. Sorry, this is a little Let's see, that's not mine. That's fine. I'll, uh, okay. So anyway, Dream Big helps us stay focused. You know, we have this huge dream, and that's you know we want to see it. We we want to achieve. 
we want, we, you know, we ask for, we, we're doing <coughs> animal liberation. And, um, of course, like, dreams are nothing if you don't take steps to actually make it happen, right? So, having something so big and profound would mean nothing if we didn't actually take uh, small steps to, uh, to get there. Um, and I think it definitely helps people stay focused because, um, you know, you want to, you, you actually want to make sure that you are reevaluating yourself and criticizing yourself in a way that, like, is effective so that you can make this vision a reality. Um, and so, like, what motivates us to take actions in the inside of stores? Um, it's, it's this vision, but it's also, you know, how we work towards it. So I was actually thinking about how every action, you know, we're going inside of Chipotle and, you know, it's very confrontational. Um, going inside of these stores, being confront, you know, being confronted with, or while we're confronting others, we're also being confronted with sort of like aggressive people. How, why, how can, you know, why do, we, why do we go back and do it again? Um, it's because we think that we're making a difference, and it's because we are. Um, I, every time, I, like, my, my personal motivation, every time we go in there is like, okay, this is happening now, but, like, just fast forward, like, maybe one or two, or maybe even, like, you know, like, who knows, a few months from now, uh, which is kind of, that is a really big dream, but, you know, maybe, like, in a couple of years where, I, I've told a lot of you this, like, imagine a world where, you know, People, before going to a restaurant where there, there's animals being served, people are going to think twice because they're going to be like, oh my god, there's going to be protesters there. Like, that, that's, you know, that keeps me motivated. And we might not be there yet, we might not get there tomorrow, next month, but it is going to happen. I know that that's going to happen, and that's what keeps me motivated. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so, so that's that. And then, Heather, did you want to? Yeah, I wanted to remind that in the beginning of this presentation, Wayne had a, a, a little graphic with a circle and, and there were five, the five principles were around it and that is because you've probably been hearing a lot of the same things over and over and these five principles do touch on each other. They in, they're interwoven with each other. Um, and one of the things that Kelly touched on was um, the term burnout and it's actually a psychological term that refers to long-term exhaustion and diminished interest in work. Dreams, big dreams and visualizing those things can keep us focused and inspire us, and, but they can also be a positive indulgence when you feel burned out. Um, it's a, burning out is a term that I've heard several times since I've become an activist, which has been about a year. Um, I've heard about activists that are no longer active because they became tired and disinterested because of working for something that seems so unattainable and because of infighting and drama. Earlier I spoke about how positive visualization keeps me coming back here week after week, but I've only been at this a year. What happens in 10 years? In 20 years? How many years has Wayne been at it? 12? 14? I mean, what, what will keep us coming back? What will keep us going when, when, you know, all of these things keep getting in our way and the years start piling up and, and it's exhausting? Um, and I believe it's that dream. It's that vision. Um, not just because of the sad look in the animal's eye for whom at that moment I can do nothing, but the idea that I can change all the eyes of all the animals. And that's the, the visualization and the dream. The dream of that happening can keep us focused, like Priya said, on, on trying to see the world that we want, and that should be, and keep us from things like exhaustion. And when we're human beings, and wherever there are human beings, there's going to be drama and conflict, and keeping that vision in mind is going to help us move on from that in, in a timely manner, and get back to what's really important. Um, Burnout may happen when you have difficulty believing, when you begin to feel like one drop of ocean in, an, in an, I mean, one drop in an ocean of ignorance, horrors, illogical thoughts, skepticism, and greed. But taking the time to visualize, and this is where the indulgence part comes in, um, to dream of that world the way we want it and the way it should be, we can begin to see things with a renewed energy. And animal liberation is something we're gonna have to fight for, and in order to fight for something, you have to believe in it. So, um, 
I think that uh, the, 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 the visualization of those big dreams that we talk about is going to keep us from suffering from burnout. And um, I think that's really, really important because in order, for this, in order for us to be successful, we need to keep doing this. Um, it's, it, it could happen next year, but if it doesn't, we need to be still here 10 years from now. So. And just one more thing. Um, I know Heather, you touched on this slightly, but um, as we know, the animal rights movement has uh, you know, definitely been uh, looked at as a movement for the most part where it, there's, there's a lot of negativity, there's a lot of pessimism. Um, you know, the words depression and like exhaustion and burnout, unfortunately, are not words that, you know, we think are, you know, that are not, un that are uncommon. Um, but uh, I think one aspect of dreaming big is that uh, this, uh, this underlying, um, you know, optimism. And that's really important because, like, you want to come back here, you know, you want, people want to be in spaces where they're going to feel important, they're going to feel like they're achieving something, that they feel acknowledged, and they, they feel, um, they feel, like, optimistic about. So, optimism is extremely important in, in movement building. That's what's going to keep us, keep, you know, keep it, uh, keep this movement sustainable and keep us coming back. And I've actually been quite surprised at the low level of drama and that kind of thing that's been happening with this group and I think one of the reasons for that is because we are very focused on what on that dream and we are very focused on what we're doing and because we have these interwoven five principles that keep us keep us going and keep keeping us feel feeling positive um, and dreams are definitely one of the big ones so dream on <laughs> So I'm going to drag Brian up, even though he doesn't know he's coming up, <laughs> because Brian has been such an important part of Direct Action Everywhere since we started this group. You can take a seat. And um, yeah, when I look back on what we've accomplished since the beginning of 2013, just a year ago, we started this. It's kind of incredible. I mean, like, Ronnie and I met at the end of 2012. We ran into Saf, um, Chris, and a few other folks a few months later. We didn't meet Kelly and Heather until the end of of 2013 when we were doing the Earthlings March. And Ryan came in, I think, at a first open meeting where we expanded from South Bay to San Francisco. And the idea that this kind of ragtag group of grassroots activists, many of whom had no experience. I mean, I think I'm the only one who even had significant experience as an activist. And it's not like I'm that old. I'm 32 years old. I'm not, I'm not a grizzled veteran of any <laughs> activist movement at this point. I'm still a fairly young man. The idea that this ragtag group of activists of very little experience, no money, certainly no power, <laughs> could create a movement that got national press attention, that mobilized 41 cities around the country, that posed a serious threat to one of the largest multinational corporations in the world. I mean, Chipotle closed down its largest San Francisco stores the last month in response to our protest. The market capitalization has slowed to basically a halt since our campaign started. And you can't attribute that entirely to us, but certainly we're part of the mosaic of information and pressure that's causing this corporation to think twice about the things it's saying about animals causing it to think twice about saying that it loves animals by killing tens of millions of animals every year. And I always think back to this thing that, that you always emphasize about direct action everywhere, and that is, and there's this wonderful video that Asaf made that you haven't seen yet, but will come out eventually, that Brian makes this really wonderful point about how what struck him most, and you can talk about this more, about direct action everywhere, is that you've just never been exposed to people who are willing to confidently state their moral position. And to, do you, you want to talk about it? Um, I mean, I don't think there's much more to say. <laughs> <laughs> like, explain your, you want to talk about your reaction to the Stanford action, which is the first one you participated in? Because I think that, that it, your reaction to that encapsulates yeah. the effect we're trying to achieve at large. Not just in you, but in activists all over the world. Well, yeah, I, I, I think before the Stanford action, before I had gotten involved with DXC, I think I had had the kind of stereotypical experience of someone who was tangentially involved in the animal rights movement. Um, I had been be vegan for a few years. I had tried to kind of slowly encourage some of my friends to consider adopting a partially vegetarian, perhaps totally vegetarian. I wasn't even thinking about people even adopting a vegan diet. You know, trying to say, oh, it's healthy for you. Oh, you know, animals are suffering in some way. Um, and, and this went on for years and nothing really occurred. I didn't really have much of an impact on people. 
I was the only one I knew who believed in animal rights. Um, and you know, once I found out about DXE, I went to a meeting or two, and they had they had this plan to protest uh, this this um, film screening of this kind of locavore organic film that was all about uh, kind of how how American farmers are doing the world some good by killing animals. And this was a totally foreign experience. I. I was, threw you into the fire. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it was probably one of the most confrontational uh, demonstrations involving DXE. There were a lot. Of, there was a lot of yelling, and I, I was not. I was not even. You know, like I was not actually on stage. I was just in the audience. Uh, you know, filming the thing, and it was the most scary experience I've ever had in my life. I was so <laughs> afraid, you know, because the, the, you know, the most involved I'd ever gotten was just kind of talking to friends and saying, like, I mean, the most involved actually I'd ever gotten was handing out leaflets and saying, hey, consider vegan, and then, like, walking away, right? So, so to, see, to see these people go up on stage, hold signs, you know, they're yelling at each other, and freaking out, and I'm, not, I'm literally sitting there with an iPhone, just, <laughs> I, you know, I can only imagine what's going through, you know, their minds and their hearts, so, uh, but that was, it was such a beautiful and spiritual experience, I mean, you know, earlier, Kelly, you were saying that we have people like myself, who were very afraid of doing these kind of things, uh, who were very unwilling, and in fact, we were very resistant to these things, who actually believed that this was not the right approach. Um, and you said after a while, oh, uh, you know, a lot of these people say, you know what, I'll do it, I'll do it. I, I would go even further. I don't think that there are, there are people who, you know, previously were resistant to this idea of doing direct, ac direct action and now are okay with it. Now there are people who were resistant to direct action and now love it more than anything else. If anything, I want to do another one of these disruptions. I want to point see. out that... The Cultivate Festival that I was telling you about, which was way scary. Guess who did the speak out? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just a few months later. Just a few months later. So we, we threw him in the fire at Stanford and then Cultivate in front of, I think it was more than 200. I mean, yeah. supposedly it's, there it's were. at least 350. Okay. It, there were supposedly tens, if not close to 100,000 people at the festival. And so there were a lot of people. And it was very hostile because these are all people who love eating animals and came here to eat animals. And here's Brian coming up with a big band that just says, Stop the violence. So, I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't hostile or angry, he was just very assertive and strong and said, like, this needs to stop. He said, I mean, I remember the first line is, did you ever think about how that pig felt about being carved up for, for you to eat today? And it, it's a very simple question, and it wasn't an angry question, it's just, did you think about it? And it was a question that people didn't want to hear. And so they're angry at you, and there's this big buffoon who comes up and grabs you and, like, pushes you and takes <laughs> your banner and starts screaming at you. Wow. It, was just, it, was, it was such a powerful demonstration. And, Awesome. Yeah, and I think yeah. I mean, we're we're lucky to have Brian, and he unfortunately might be leaving us. Oh, for Yale. Yale. For Yale. So, but for a year. But for a year. For Yale. For for Yale next year. But we're hoping he sticks around and works with us. Um, so the last slide we have here is, is direct action is everywhere, and that strong movements can inspire, following, and change the world. And this is a picture of Tahir Square, and I think it's 2011. And Tahir Square is in is in Egypt. And it was the product of a movement called the Arab Spring. And the Arab Spring, I'm getting chills just thinking about it right now, is, is to me such a powerful model for change because any of the historians, political scientists, journalists who are looking at the state of the Arab world in 2010, 2011, when the Arab Spring ultimately kind of took over the world, I would have said that this is not going to happen. I mean, these people are more or less content with the state of the world they're living in. They're, they might be unhappy. They might be living in a di dictatorial regime. But the idea that change could happen, even within a lifetime, is just impossible. But there was one man, Mohammed Bazizi, in Tunisia, a fairly small country, not a very influential country in, in the Arab world, who was experiencing this oppression on a daily basis and decided one day that it was enough. I mean, I can't take this anymore, personally. And he was beaten up, his fruit cart was taken from him, and he went to the governor's mansion, he screamed out, you're taking my life away, you're taking my children away, I cannot feed myself if you continue to do these things. And I will not stand for this anymore. And they, of course, ignored him, because that's what powerful institutions do. They ignore people who want to create some sort of change. And he said, all right, I'm not going to take this anymore. And he lit himself a fire of gasoline and burned himself alive. And everyone around him, and even journalists who reported this incident initially, said, this is crazy. He's just a nutcase who decided to do something that is not going to have any effect at all. But what happened was, if you look at, if you look at the principles of direct action ever, all of them came to effect in the context of that of that message. I mean, total animal liberation. He said, I am not going to accept the daily indignities and tyranny of this regime. I am going to speak strongly for what I believe in, which is that all of us have the right to live and be free. Direct action. 
it's, it's, it's a certainly a social faux pas, and it's illegal for you to go out to a mansion, especially in a tyrannical dictatorial regime, and burn yourself alive. He wasn't afraid to provoke the public, the government, even his own friends and family, to greater consciousness. Storytelling. I mean, the powerful thing about this action was not just that it was a powerful action in and of itself, but the story spread far and wide. Friends were telling their friends. Families were telling their families. And what started out as just one little action and one little story spread all over the world. So people in the United States aren't hearing this story of a person who burned himself alive. Community. So all of these people not only were telling these stories to each other, but they started building communities. They started talking to each other and saying, like, you know what? What this guy did, maybe we need to do this too. Maybe we need to start taking a stand too, because what's happening in this world is not acceptable, and we need to stop it. And finally, dreams. I mean, if these people had all been negative and cynical and thought, you know what, we'd love to do something about this, but there's a tank down the street, there's a guy with a gun down the street, and I can't do anything about this. But they didn't think that way. They said, you know what, we can do this. Look at the history of social movements over the past 2,000 years. Look at this history of social movements even in the past 50 years around the world that have succeeded beyond their wildest imagination. Let's go and do this. Even if it comes at huge sacrifice to myself, I believe in this so much, I believe in what we've accomplished, I'm willing to take that sacrifice. And all those things culminated in a movement that was able to take over Tahrir Square and ultimately cause revolutions in three different countries. And still is causing, causing reverberations all around the world. Because the Arab Spring led to Occupy Wall Street. Occupy Wall Street led to the Indignados in Spain and the occupation of squares in Tel Aviv. And ultimately it inspired people in the animal rights movement too. We look at these stories, we look at the effectiveness of these movements and we say to ourselves, we can do that too. We can do that too. And to me, that's what Direct Action Ever Ultimate is all about. So um, I'm glad all of you are here today. Um, the other thing Direct Action Ever is definitely about is getting feedback. So I'm hoping we can have a little bit of a conversation afterwards. Um, if there are aspects of this presentation, what DXE has done and is doing that you'd like some more explanation about, or even if you'd like to criticize some of the stuff we do, we very much believe in dialogue as a method to get to better answers and better solutions for the animal rights movement and the world. So without further ado, why don't we open things up? I'm Brian, since you didn't take part, in the presentations of much. Do you want to lead the discussion? Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, mediate and at least mediate. And yeah, it. for sure. Mediate and. So, does anyone have any questions or thoughts? Brian, you can take one. I've got a question for you, Brian. Yeah, go um, When I first heard about you guys, I didn't know how long you guys have been established. I think I first saw it maybe on Facebook or something. Maybe Adrian shared, I don't recall. But I had thought one way to do a sit on, a sit in rather than Chipotle would be. To go in with a group like this, but a large group, you know, pass their occupancy and just be customers and go in and purchase, you know, something, even if you don't end up eating it, even if you do eat it, and just sit during a busy time because it would shut down their their um, occupancy. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's certainly been something that we're I was wondering if you guys had considered anything like that. It's still nonviolent, but it's still effective because they can't come in and push you out. It'd be hard for them to determine who you are too. I wouldn't say go in and be active. I'd say go in and be passive just as a customer, but like 50 people and just, you know, I've been in Chipotle in the past when just under normal pretenses, there's like 60 people in line. Yeah. Way I mean, in. The structure of a lot of our previous actions is that it has been very similar to yeah. that. So we will go in uh, pretending to be customers and, you know, the, the most recent uh, kind of non-standard protest version um, of our actions was we, we went in, we posed as customers, and then one by one we stood up and unrolled uh, banners that said, uh, we will not forget, and it showed a picture of some, some kind of animal in some kind of horrible abusive situation. We've been talking about doing a sit-in for a while, and we very, much, we very well might do something almost exactly like that. Yeah, I was thinking uh, if, you did it, if you did it where you're not a customer, you just go in, It'd probably be effective at that point. They can single out and say, like, hey, you're not eating, you need to leave. Yep. You know, you're probably part of this group, you're in ordinary clothes. But I figured if you're there eating or if you purchase food and you're just sitting there conversating, it'd be really hard for them to sit there and, you know, wean out who is a standard customer and who's there for the effect. I think part of the reason, though, um, that we might not want to purchase their food is not actually like giving them money because Chipotle is like a $16 billion corporation, but just like refusing to participate in their um, system, their game that they have, and, and making that bold stance that perhaps might cause them to call us out, might cause them to try to kick us out earlier, would also perhaps be more compelling. Oh, I agree. I had that thought too. I was thinking I don't want to contribute to their, their finance, but I was thinking yeah. if you shut down, you know, the ability for, if you did that, if you had, I don't know how much money it would cost, but just say an arbitrary amount, and it costs maybe $3,000 to have for a flat two weeks, do that every night during the rush hour. Yeah. 
You know, they're going to lose. They're going to lose twenty thousand or fifty thousand dollars because people aren't going to want to come back in and deal with it. Just like you were saying, at some point, people are going to know there's going to be activists present. Yeah. So and it could have created an interesting storyline for the price. Yeah, we'll give a big like, plug. Yeah. 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 Solar has all these people. They're so they don't yeah. shop anything. They're just buying like a little like guacamole container. <laughs> 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 Sitting there with their blogger only container for four hours. Or they're so successful they don't have room for their people. Like, don't even <laughs> yeah. announce it as a direct action thing, yeah. but then, like, how do they respond to that? Like, how are they going to please their customer base? Yeah. And because these are spaces that are open to the public, they can't just kick people out of the I mean, it's funny. I, the Berkeley Chipotle knows me so well right now. If I go in in normal garb, they just, like, tell me to leave immediately. Exactly. <laughs> but I, just, I put a hat on and sunglasses, and I was able to walk in. They, like, they kind of looked at me funny for a little bit. I'm like, I'm not sure. You can't just target Chinese people. <laughs> Get out of them all out. So, I, you know, like one of the things about DXC that we didn't emphasize as much today, and we, we talked about it a little bit, is that we really want spontaneous creativity. So, we want people to have ideas like this and just go execute them and let us, let us give you the infrastructure, give you the resources you need, the materials you need to go and do them. And it's funny because we're not like a big budget organization. In 2013, we spent $1,500 for all the stuff we were doing, you know, right. and we spent less this year. So. Uh, but but I think so. A bigger part of what people need is just the intellectual and moral support, and kind of and yeah, we have a lot of digital files, and we have a lot of volunteer labor for people like Heather and Kelly who do incredible design work. But you know, I think lots of times what people just need is just that infrastructure. It's not even that they need big money; they don't need you to be paid to do it. Because most of us are doing these things because we believe in them, not because we need someone to pay us to do them or to give us incentives to do them. It's because we just intrinsically are motivated to do them. So I think, I mean, I think an idea like that is beautiful, and it's exactly the sort of thing we went. And maybe you guys can do, do it in Sacramento, and oh, yeah. you know, convince us to do it in the Bay Area, and suddenly thirty cities will be doing this, and all over the country we'll have people just saying Chipotle with a little guacamole, right. <laughs> five hours at a time. Doing because before you started to speak, I'm sorry I didn't get to uh, Brian. Did you have something to say? You raised your hand, I believe. Oh yeah. Um, well, and then yeah. we'll get to Brian. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I mean, sort of, um, sort of related, um, but. I guess I was kind of thinking about how it's it's interesting to, to target like a, a giant corporation like this because um, it seems like there's a movement right now that people are kind of <coughs> uh, a lot of people you know a lot of people that are really kind of into this concept of like um, you know there's like this one percent there's the ninety nine percent you know there's this story of like yeah. there's these people that are that are kind of exploiting all of us in a way and and I kind of think that it's it's almost related to like when I talk to people about um, or when I hear people talk about like their their thoughts about like eating animals, a lot of times people are like, oh, you know, like you gotta do it. It's it's like you need it for this and you need it for that. And I feel like our society, the majority of people are sort of you know just totally duped. They're totally kind of like been brainwashed a bit by this. And and I feel like those people need like need to be like kind of woken up a bit and need to, like have a an, an opportunity to to like re to rethink that. And I think. Kind of a, a good channel to get to get to the into those people's minds is like, hey, you know, maybe these corporate profits, you know, aren't actually in line with, with what you're like, you know, what you really feel like inside of them, you know, if you really examine like how you feel. Um, and it's like, even though you've been told all your life that you need to eat meat and that you know every meal has to include like animal bodies, you know, it's like, um, yeah, it's some, something like that. It's like it seems like targeting targeting the corporation is kind of like this David versus Goliath thing that. That like a lot of people right now can can kind of start to like relate to and say like oh yeah maybe you know maybe what they're doing um, isn't really for for us if maybe maybe we don't need that and like you know maybe we can fight that you know so maybe more people can kind of like be inspired to join to like fight against that the, yeah. the, they're they're like they're just making huge profits at the expense of you know tens of millions of animals lives every year. seriously some of the best kind of um, public. Uh, Support from our campaign has come from people who are totally not related to DXC. Some of the people who are totally not even involved in animal rights. I actually, I was like 20 minutes late to this meeting because I was just having, um, I was just having lunch with uh, my friend who's a math major at Cal and previously had not been involved with animal rights at all, but had seen some of our demonstrations um, on YouTube. And he's now stopped eating animals. He is now like, energized over animal rights, and he thinks the Chipotle campaign is super fantastic. Um, you know, I mean, Wayne mentioned this very briefly, but at a few of our demos um, against both UC Berkeley and UCSF for experimenting on animals, 
uh, people unsolicited, unsolicited have come up to us and said, are you, are you guys uh, protesting Chipotle? Is this Chipotle? <laughs> and, 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 you know, my initial hypothesis was that, okay, our signs are red and black. <laughs> and, and we're kind of animal rights people, so maybe, you know, they think we're the same thing. But these are not even people that had been at the previous Chipotle protest and seen our uh, black and red signs and then had made the association. These were people who had heard about our campaign from friends who were talking about the Chipotle campaign. Um, so, like, people are really on board. I mean, like, the zeitgeist is seriously, it is changing. I mean, you know, like, you saw this uh, in, on the New York Times, on the front page um, of the New York Times a few days ago, it was uh, Stephen, we uh, Stephen Wise and the Non-Human Rights Project saying that animals are not property. Animals should be treated as legal persons. Um, so I think, you know, this, this welfare dynamic is like being blown out of the water right now. And I think we're in a very nice time. Yeah. Anyways, Bruna? Oh, yeah. Hi. Um, I, so I want to talk about the Chipotle campaign. And um, so one, just, you know, to share my perspective on it. Um, I think that um, one of the, re a lot of people ask me, oh, Bronwyn, well, they're better than, you know, McDonald's. They, you know, like, at least they're saying something positive or they're doing something positive. Um, and my response to that is that um, this is actually not the case. When, when you tell someone who cares about animals, if you are giving them the constant message that you can still care about animals if you are abusing them to a lesser degree, then they will take the easy option. 100% of the time. They will say, okay, I'll do that. If you put a label on it that says free range, I'll eat it regard, and I'm not going to do a lot of work and see if that's true, um, rather than cut it out completely. Um, people are always going to pick the easier option if that is, unless there's a strong message that says this is wrong. Um, one thing that I bring people's attention to is a sign that is in the that was in um, some of the Whole Foods, rest, uh, Whole Foods supermarkets that said, a hearty helping of animal compassion with every order. This sign had the words animal compassion in enormous letters, and it was over their um, counter that was holding the bodies of um, young animals, and um, it was, it's, um, it's not a positive message, because people, if you, because people will, people will eat it up, and people will take it, but it is not a positive message because it is not actually pro-animal, it is actually very much anti-animal. Yeah. Yeah. It, is, it is not a, a message of animal compassion, it is actually a message of cruelty. And one parallel that I like to make is I like to ask myself, um, do groups that fight for gay rights, for women's rights, for um, people of color's right, um, colored people's rights, um, would they ever um, accept compromise? Would they ever say, I am happy to, you know, accept that the sweatshop workers are at least no longer being beaten while they work, or at least no longer being locked. You know, like this is not positive. People they would not say, you know, we don't want these people to be abused less. They would say we want these people to be no longer abused. You would never hear a women's rights group advocating for people to use roofies over knives during rapes. Yeah. This would never happen. This would, if if there was a if there was a women's rights group that was advocating for kinder rapes. This would be a huge outcry because that is fundamentally wrong and it is unjust. Just like what Chipotle is doing is not, you know, advocating that, you know, rape be done in a different manner rather than be abolished is anti woman. Just as saying um, murder against murder of non humans should be done in a different manner is anti animal. Yeah. Um, and then the last point I wanted to make was that um, people respond to honesty and people respond to integrity of a message. Um, the idea of humane slaughter is inherently a message without integrity and inherently a message without truth. And that is the idea that you can love someone and kill them. Um, but the message that you cannot kill someone and love them and you cannot respect someone and abuse them, that is a message with integrity and that is why people that we talk to on the street often respond positively because they respond to the honesty. I could not agree more. Yeah, really well said, Bronwyn. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. Heather, Heather is something to I say. I want to jump off of what Bronwyn's saying and give two stories that recently happened to me. Um, one was that uh, on the Facebook posts, uh, there was a woman who came on one of our Facebook posts and was arguing what we often hear. Oh, but they offer vegan options. Why are you protesting this place? They're, they're moving towards, you know, good things, blah, blah, blah. 
and you know, Priya was trying to explain this and that, blah, blah. She wasn't, this woman was not hearing anything. Finally, Priya just went to the blog post of the seven deadly sins of Chipotle that, that Wayne wrote, this blog post, and that presentation that we were talking about. She copy-pasted them all into a comment. Immediately, this woman changed her mind. I was just like floored. I was like, whoa. She, and then she started asking questions, how can I get involved? I was just like, oh. That's one story. The other story I have is about a friend of mine um, that I went to high school with who, one of those few friends of mine on Facebook who hasn't blocked me from their news feed, um, <laughs> who commented on one of my things, you know, oh, but Heather, you know, we just, we do so good because we only eat grass-fed, humane meat, and blah, blah, blah. You know, she was trying to let me know that she was, she was, she understood my message, and I'm like, no, I said, there is. <laughs> yeah, and this is, this is the thing. We don't want people to think, because they're eating humane meat, that or, there is no humane yeah. meat, because they're eating things that are labeled humane, they're labeled natural, they're labeled organic, that they're on my bandwagon. That, no. <laughs> You know, and so I, I try, you know, I try to explain that to her. And, you know, maybe some of that sunk in, maybe it didn't. But, but this is one of the reasons we're, we're interested in Chipotle. Because there are pe pe the people that are going to Humane Meat. These are the people that actually care. And we don't want them caring to be okay with that. We want them caring to be okay with not killing animals. Yeah, we'll lose people, um, we will lose the, if you, like I was saying about choosing the new path, like these are the people who would be joining us, but instead they're just going to go with, you know, supporting the, you know, quote unquote, local farmers or, you know, the humane slaughter. You know, we're losing these people to an easier, softer, more hypocritical message. So we need to bring these people out into the open and bring them into, you know, a more honest, true message. And the message that's ultimately just reinforcing species like crazy because it's saying that violence is not just an okay thing, it's a positive, good <coughs> thing, right? Like that's going completely the opposite direction. And there, there has been a very strong history of pretty terrible uh, social justice groups that have been advocating for change of this sort. I mean, when, when, you, when you speak of this example of a privileged class of individuals, humans, who Kitty refers to as the 1%. Kitty says that <laughs> humans are the 1%, and I really I could not agree more with that. Um, getting an easy option to feel good about oppressing other individuals. I, I always think of the African Colonization Society. Um, this, was, this was a group that started in, I think, the very early 1800s, um, whose message was, yes, slavery makes us feel guilty. Yes, slavery is probably in some way wrong. Um, so what we need to do is we need to kind of convince slave owners one by one, maybe to release a few of their slaves, maybe to treat them a little bit better, but really let's not push it that hard. Um, because that would be challenging our privilege as white humans. I mean, this, this group was almost entirely uh, occupied by white humans. Um, ultimately, you know, they, they got huge support from Congress because they were a group that, that made people feel good about not really doing much. They eventually started uh, a country called Liberia in, in Africa where they would ship black Americans away because they did not want free black Americans in the United States. Um, ultimately, I think similar to how DXC is challenging a lot of these groups that are saying humane meat is okay, um, other groups, uh, much led by um, William Lloyd Garrison, who was mentioned earlier in the slides, uh, you know, challenge these groups and eventually just call them out. And, and now, you know, the African Colonization Society has completely collapsed. Historians regard it as uh, extraordinarily racist and just as a stumbling block to the anti-slavery movement. And some very good things arose uh, after its collapse. Anyways. I had another. Yeah. Or Lucia. Lucia ahead, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to make a, a quick comment about something that happened yesterday that sort of rides on what Bronwyn and, and Heather were saying about the whole, how effective the whole greenwashing and humane washing has been. We were at the Oakland Veg Week yesterday with Jean, um, mm -hmm. and Jude joined us as well down there. We were having our, the vegan drinks that were right. really vegan drinks. They were just beer. But in any case, <laughs> <laughs> we sat there, and I had two friends with me that are sort of veg curious, and I said, come on out, come on out. So they, they joined us, and one of them is a behaviorist in my school district. And 
she brought the example of um, how impressed she was with a, a, fr a couple of friends of hers who were, we were talking about, could you date a meat eater, you know, as a vegan, so on and so forth. And I think Jude brought the question up. And she said, oh, I'm so impressed with this couple that I know. He's a meat eater, she's not. And they've been married for, what, 20-some years? And how wonderful that they've been compromising. I find that to be so respectful. And right away, almost in unison, all three of us said, well, you know, we happen to be ethical vegans, whatever that means. And I, I find that to be not a real respectful choice, but a really sort of the, this mediocre, you know, middle of the road. And they're compromising, how beautiful, and you know, let the birds sing and everything. Let <laughs> 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 one of them sing and let the other sing. <laughs> and I yeah. said, oh, so she's never really, uh, you know, really sort of expressed her, uh, I don't know, some sort of disgust or an she objection. Did. And she said, no, but they just really cohabitate quite magically. And, and she was really thinking she was impressing us until we said none of us would ever be able to deal with this. I mean, that is really an offensive um, stance to take, especially if you truly love someone and you really believe and understand what they're standing for and what they, you know, what the what is at the heart, at the core of their passion. So it was interesting how we all sort of not shut her down, but <laughs> like, you know, that's not really an ethical stand that we would take. But. It's coming from someone who is not a vegetarian, but who professes, she claims to be very into healthy eating. She loves her animals, she loves her pit bull, but yet oh, there was this, you know, really sort of a, I don't know, self-praising uh, um, mm -hmm. notion that she had, how happy I'm, she I was. I made a, a kind of a good comment and said something like, well, of course, that's what love does. That's what she right? Thankfully, she didn't like Make sure think I was insulting her. Right? Like, I kind of was not right. right. Nonetheless, <laughs> we have not <laughs> lost hope. Right. Right. What? No, I want to say, nonetheless, I have not lost hope with with people and acquaintances and friends that I have that who may be you know, leaning yeah. towards no, that she direction. Was yeah, she's lovely. Yes, but I mean, most, if not all of us, probably. Eat animals at some point in our lives. Oh, right, yeah. right, right, exactly. Well, and even if we don't eat animals now, we're still benefiting off the exploitation of, them, historically okay. speaking, and currently. And so yeah. we can't. We're not trying to take a stance of moral purity. You know that right. we're better right. than someone else. Right. We have to be open enough to accept people to exactly. come in, and you know, and and realize that we're all we're all part of the system. Mm -hmm. And in order mm -hmm. to change it, we need everybody to everybody to. Be a part of that change right. as well. And I think, and I embrace dialogue, a dialogue like that, a conversation that can happen. I think once we said, well, we would never, we still kept uh, the conversation mm -hmm. in really friendly mm -hmm. terms. We talked about it a little bit more, but I don't think she ever felt like, oh, I'm so vegan. Oh, no. <laughs> We're an animal rights activist. You know, she knew what we all right. do, and she knows me quite well. So it, it, I was happy that it didn't turn you take that, yeah. that direction. But it's one of those things where later, it, just the very fact that there was a a, a, not necessarily a tension, meaning a, a mean negative thing, but just the fact that there was a little bit of tension in the zeitgeist, as it were. Yeah. Later, that will yeah, know, it in might her mind, or, but it little probably little happens to her a lot with you. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? It's just yes, like a little bit of something that gets somebody's mm -hmm. attention. A little bit of tension. That's so, okay. anyways, I I did not get your name. What Dustin. Justin. Dustin. Dustin. Yeah. You so you you had something. Yeah, to say? I was thinking on something in response. I think he had a good point initially. I think he got a little sidetracked, and I know it became a little consuming, but I think what the problem really is, and it related to everybody, because I was thinking about it as everybody spoke, is humoring the intention. And I think with uh, Chipotle's marketing campaign, they're genius. They have top marketers behind them working on it, and it's about appealing to the humoring of intention because we're so privileged and entitled in America and other developed places that we only go enough to humor shots and not actually yeah. fulfill our manifest our intentions. And I think it's dangerous to allow Chipotle to do what they're doing because it is, it's going to detract and shift into a comfortable, safe place for people to dwell. Yeah. Whereas what you guys are doing now is saying, oh, it is about defeating humor and attention. It's about living up those expectations that you have and not being anthropocentric. It's about being illuminated in what you're doing and being clear about it. Yeah. Uh, it's like a sickness in America, I think, yeah. it's humoring the intention. Uh, all of you guys think alike, and it would be okay to have a discussion where everybody says yes and have a love fest and go home. Yeah. I'm not here to do that. For sure. I'm here, I have a contrarian view here, and so that's what I was raising. And I respect all of you. I'm with you, though. No, I'm, I'm, I understand yeah. that. Because what happens is direct action, you guys are very small. Okay? Chipotle is a $16 billion company. And if you can use them somehow to leverage towards your goals, that would be a smarter thing to do, is what I think. And I may be wrong, by the way, you know, 
time will tell who is wrong and who is right and so on. So if you take the comparison between animal rights and, uh, and LGBT rights and all the other rights movements, what I see is that human beings, the privileged human beings that you call us, in fact, we are arrogant human beings, we never had to give up anything. To give a gay person his rights or her rights, we didn't have to give up anything. We just had to let them be. In the case of animal rights, that is, we are asking a population to give up some great privilege that they day in and day out partake of. And I think comparing this movement with an LGBT movement, I think is folly. Because this is a huge movement compared to LGBT. What about the anti-slavery movement? What about the anti-slavery movement? I think there, is, there, is, there are parallels to the slavery movement. Absolutely, I agree. Because people had to give up. But only 1% of the people had to give up on slavery, mm -hmm. not not majority of the people. Here we are talking about 99.9% .9 of the people have to give up some of the privileges that they partake of day in and day out. And that's why we need to be thinking smarter and differently and not actually draw parallels. We should draw parallels where we can, yeah. but we should not fool ourselves into thinking that it's the same. So I think empirically, as, as an economist, I can say, in terms of the significance of slavery <coughs> to the American economic system, including everyone who participates and benefits to, from it, that's not true. I mean, the American, the slave system was pretty much the economy of the South and was hugely influential in the North, too, and provided benefits to everyone up and down the chain. So I'm, but, but I'm just saying that this is, it, it isn't the case that only 1% of the people in the United States benefited from slavery in, in the 1800s. And in fact, 1% of the economy currently is probably animal agriculture in the United States, and it, you know, 1% here and there, we lose 1% of our economy all the time. But we're talking about like 30, 40, 50, 60% of the economy in the 1800s for the yeah, anti-slavery. So they're, they're, they're big differences, but they're not actually differences in the way that you're structuring them. They're, no, but yeah. I don't disagree with exactly what you're saying. Yeah. That is true. Economically, slavery was a huge institution. And, and animal agriculture is quite small. 80, 90%. What I'm saying is that this movement requires individuals to change. You require an individual to change. And if you look at slave owning, even though that was part of the huge part of the economy, individuals didn't have to change at a 99.9% .9 level. Whereas in animal rights, we need everybody to change. And yeah. that is a huge difference compared to slavery. So there are parallels, but there are not also parallels, and we got to be smart about that. Yeah, I, I think uh, people did have to change, but we, I'll let Ryan. I would like to just say that I like really agree with the idea that, that like that, and I think it's what everyone here is like interested in doing and, and trying to do is just be like be really creative um, about how to pull pe pull everyone, you know, pull the majority of people into this this way of thinking that oh maybe these individuals aren't you know worthless, maybe they actually do have worth and like do deserve to have rights, you know. And, and it's like, how do we, and I think it's, yeah, it's just like, I mean, I think that's a great question to always be asking ourselves, like, how can we most effectively, like, pull people in and get, get them to think about that and think about it in that way, like, you know, so, it's, I don't, I'm not sure, I don't know the answer. Chris, yeah, sorry, yeah. Yeah, I know you wanted to respond to me. No, it's, it's also sort of the difference of what we were talking about, that there are these moderate voices and there are these other voices around and what we feel was lacking in the animal liberation movement was a strong direct action stance and so um, and that's what we talked about so the difference between talking about treating animals better which Chipotle may be talking about is treating them as equals treating them as morally equal to us and so and I think that's the message that we want to convey and the reason there's another reason that I think Chipotle is a better target than most other companies is most other companies advertise their products, the products that they're selling. Chipotle really advertises the idea that eating animals is good. And they do this in a variety of ways, but they, all, they say it's not just good for humans, but they also say it's good for the environment, and they even say it's good for the animals. And they say that if you care about animals, you should buy their flesh from Chipotle. And so the idea that we are really, so one of the things about, and that we didn't really talk about, is changing the face of the animal rights movement. If you find someone at random, maybe not so much in the Bay Area, but in other places, and even in the Bay Area, um, I've been to places 
where I talk about animal rights and I'll have someone tell me, oh, I totally agree with you. I'm on the same page, animal rights all the way. We should not eat factory farmed animals. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, you eat, so you, and, he, and I said, no, I don't think you understand me at all. And, <laughs> and he, said, he said, no, no, we, you know, I, I only eat chicken when I know how the chicken was raised and this and that. And I said, no, we just should not be doing any violence at all to anyone. We should not be hurting anyone at all because they're different from us. And he says, well, everything in moderation. And I said, <laughs> so, so, well, so what I told him was, what about justice? Is justice something that we want only in moderation? And so, like, what we want is an uncompromising message. When people say animal rights now in a lot of places in the country and possibly the world, I'm not really very aware of the rest of the world, they think, I totally agree, we should treat animals better. We should give them more room. They should be able to walk around before we kill them. That's what the average person thinks when they hear animal rights. What I want people to think when they hear animal rights is, animals deserve the right to their own lives and their own bodies. Everyone, everyone who's sentient deserves a right to their own life and their own body, and no one has the right to take that away. And so Chipotle is so key. The fact that they are, have this message of treating animals nicer, of food with integrity, the fact that they have that message and that so many people think that they're an animal rights friendly company, that makes them an even better target because we want people to say animal rights means they deserve their own lives and their own bodies. And that's why it's key to go after Chipotle as opposed to another. I mean, there's other reasons as well. But to me, that's the most powerful reason, that we need the face of the movement to be changed. And that is leveraging that. Yeah. We're leveraging the most effective way we possibly could. Leveraging someone doesn't always mean working with them. Sometimes right. you leverage your adversaries, right. you know? Yeah. So that goes my question. Yeah, and we are leveraging them. So I agree with you completely, but I think the answer is we are leveraging them into very positive effects. Mm -hmm. Sorry, another appointment. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, Mike. Thank you for coming. Thank you. You just had another obligation. Sorry. Yeah. No problem. Have a great day. Appreciate it. Hope to see you soon. I was just going to say, I was really taken by the first part of your guys' presentation in regards to total animal liberation because I think that idea is the most potent part of delivering that, changing the idea about the animal, animal liberation movement because you're right in that the, um, the story needs to change in what animal liberation is and what people think when they hear about it or when they see a group or when they see protests then they need to have an idea of total animal liberation rather than moderation because moderation is what always goes in people's minds in general and um, in their own ideas about how to treat animals and so I just, I don't know, I just wanted to say, share that I really liked I, I mean, I've been a vegan for three years, and um, animal liberation is a really important idea, but it's not, at, for me, I feel in our animal rights stuff, it hasn't sunken in mm. enough to just have it be a feeling, and I think that's what changes people, mm -hmm. having that feeling and understanding of that, so yeah. that's a really important component, I think. Yeah, I mean, I like the fact that you use the word integrity of the message, which is, which is an important part of any action that you do. Mm -hmm. animal, animal liberation and anti-speciesism is not necessarily an inherent component of vegan advocacy. I mean, right. uh, you know, I've, I've been vegan for like four years, uh, and, and what, really, what really struck me was yesterday, I had this moment, I was... Um, listening to Moby's album from, actually, I think the year it was born. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's called Animal Rights, 
Um, and there's this really beautiful song on it called Alone, and I really love it. I don't think it's the most famous song in the album. I, like, I can't stop listening to it. And the cover of the album is a picture of Moby as a baby with his father. And his father is just holding Moby and just like looking at them. And there's just this really intense emotion to get just looking at this picture of this father looking at his son. And there's just like a lot of love that you can just feel it. I mean, it's like the picture of an album cover, but it still seeps into you. And I remember when I, when I had got this album, like, I don't know, a few years back, I thought to myself, that's so bizarre. Why, why animal rights and then this like unrelated photo of a father looking you know, into the eyes of a child, but, you know, only recently when I was kind of getting involved with DXE and I was thinking about these ideas of anti-speciesism and, like, really viewing animals as like us, did I understand that, like, the message is that we should be viewing animals, we should be loving animals and caring for animals just as this father loves his child. I just didn't get that until like, yesterday. Mm -hmm. Also, Moby is, like, the coolest thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, like, we have four cats, so we know that animals are like children. <laughs> yeah. I was raised in a household without animals. I was actually probably probably the most speciesist person to have joined DAC. I mean, I think I have changed, you know, significantly. I, I don't think I'm like, you know, free of speciesism, but like, I used to not like animals at all. It was very hateful. Were you afraid of your neighbor's dog? Yeah, species? yeah. It, it was. I mean, I you know, there are a lot of institutions that we are trying to challenge as. As, as you know, activists, that these there there are many ideas that are centuries old. I mean, advocated by Descartes, that says that animals are like these like automatons. They can't. They don't have souls. They don't have minds. They're just you know mechanical beings that move and maybe they scream, but that's just kind of there's nothing there. There's nobody there. And like I believed that for a long time. It's crazy. I um, change it. I think one of the most important things for me because I've been vegan for about ten years, basically my whole adult life, and. Um, just in the last few years, I've thought much on the micro and the macro and really putting into perspective my experience versus the experience of other things because we try to be compassionate to everything, even you know, ants. We do a lot of gardening and try to stay conscious of our environment. And I think we look at everything from our height, our perspective, um, and we forget to look at things from the perspective of the other animals. And just like even looking at flowers and seeing a bee on it, like I can't imagine how beautiful that is because that, that flower is the size of that bee or bigger, you know, potentially. And we, we don't even get to experience stuff like that in our sphere. So I think if people had more insight into us. Uh, <laughs> She's acting up. She needs some help. No worries. Like that. I mean, how often is that going to happen to you? <laughs> you need like a 600 pound dude that could like. <laughs> but yeah, just like having that perspective. All of us. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> just that perspective. I only though. like doing it with her though. Yeah. <laughs> So if that was a campaign that was pushed out, the more at least that's something we're trying to work on. We have our own side projects that we do is trying to get people to consider kind of like this. It's basically storytelling, really. It is if you were to look at it, not only just because when you look at stories, even the stories like you guys at the postcards, that's anthropocentric. That's looking at the animal's life through the eyes of a human. If you're looking at the world through the eyes of the animal, it's a different. I mean, that's good because it shows people how to relate to the animal. But if you take away your ability to relate to the animal and you start looking at the world through the animal, it's even another level that you can consider because then you're realizing there's aspects of the world that you're never going to experience as a human that are available to that creature. Yeah, you're taking I mean, that like, from like, them. Like senses that humans don't have. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I, I would say that, that these cards, and I mean, I, I'm like in love with these cards. Oh, no, they're great. I, yeah. I like them. Yeah. I mean, I kind of wish I, I should have said this. I, I was hesitant because you were saying some really good things and I didn't want to interrupt you, but I kind of wish that you could have kind of read some of these. Cards uh, a lot. Yeah, Sorry. Do you have any of the cards? Is it okay? Like, yeah. Okay. I'm not sure they are on the same. Just one of them. Like I, I think these are the best because they they are told from an animal's perspective. And I mean, obviously, it's it's reductive because it's you know a paragraph long. But I mean, that's that's the extent to which you can do this in, in a leaflet or in a card. Um, so my life is good. Oh, okay. So this is this is Yoda. He's a pig. <laughs> He um, is held in kind of a scarf. Someone is loving him right now. You can see this in the camera. <laughs> Show this close. I don't know how close is. Okay, this is okay. Um, so the card says, My life is good. I have sweaters and yummy food and straw beds. But it wasn't always that way. Scary men tried to hurt me. They put me in a truck and drove away. I squeezed through a small, home, a small hole and jumped to freedom. It really hurt when I fell onto the road, 
I was covered by cuts and bruises, but I learned that day that not all humans are bad. Good people save me from the cold and pain. And then it says uh, afterwards in a separate paragraph, Chipotle says they love animals like Yoda. That's a lie. They want to hurt and kill them, but Yoda does not want to die. Um, so I think there's, you know, it's, it's not like Yoda was, you know, in a farm. It's like this is trying to tell it from his perspective. But to address the anthropocentrism, like we, we thought about that and we tried really hard when we, to not use language that, or thoughts or ideas that we would anticipate would be only humans would have. So we tried to use only like physical sensations that like we know this pig would have. Like right. the pig would know, Yoda, I shouldn't say, say the pig, Yoda would know that he had cuts and bruises. Yoda knew that he squeezed through something, and Yoda knew that he met someone else who was nicer to him than these other people. So, you, like, this way, you know, bad, and we, we try not to use, like, very descriptive things, because we don't know exactly how Yoda experienced these things, so we couldn't really be very colorful with the descriptions. Uh, but we, we put the descriptions that I think were pretty accurate, like, as opposed as to... And it's, and it's kind of hard to do, to think. Oh, it is, yeah. It's really hard to do, and we try to do it in, um, in a way that's, we try to, because we are trying to, the, you know, the means have to be aligned with the ends. So we are trying to work against our own anthropocentrism in, uh, in everything that we do, and try to tell their stories from their perspective. It's just harder, you know, um, because we're not used to thinking about it. that perspective. Yeah, I think even like yeah. a cat hopping up on a bed, yeah. You look at the height of the cat and you look at how tall, how tall a bed is, that'd be like us jumping up on top of a house and then you think yeah. how big the bed is and the cat lounging on the bed is just a simple thought, but that'd be like us hopping up onto a yeah. house-sized mattress and just hanging out for the day and like, that sounds wonderful, yeah. but something like even like the pig, a pig that Yoda is this big compared to a human, I mean that's what, like probably 12 times its regular height, so if you yeah. compare that to a human, that might be yeah. like 80 feet, that, so yeah. you could still anthropocentrize it, but it'd be like this 80 foot tall creature took me, because that's really yeah. the perspective, I mean, yeah. we relate to it, but the biggest thing that could possess us in uh, nature may be like a bear, or you know, I don't know if you're in the water, a shark or something, but we can't really even relate to how terrifying that must be, because we have so much, even when we pick up an animal, like, who knows really, like we saw a video recently during Easter, of the bunny getting washed, um, it was on its back, and a lot of people thought it was like really cute, but the bunny was probably like in complete shock because it's got water being poured on it. And mm -hmm. I think that's a good um, agenda to push is to try to break that anthropocentrism because it helps people realize that <coughs> the rest of the world isn't relating to our experience. Yeah. Right. In the same way that when you go to another culture, don't just same assume thing, you yeah. understand all of their traditions. From your perspective and trying to see it from their perspective. Oh yeah, in Italy. Except it's just it's even it's it's that's exponentially more difficult because it is a different species with a completely different way of communicating. When I was in Italy, I had awful allergies and I was scratching a bunch walking down the street doing this. And apparently, <laughs> apparently this means fuck you in Italian. And this, I was only 15 and this man just got so mad. Like I was by myself too. And I had to run back to my hotel room because I didn't even know why he was mad. He was being I mean, Italian. <laughs> I figured it out later, but that's yeah. So I learned that lesson young. <laughs> so, I think we, we absolutely do, with, with DXC, try to tell stories from the animal's perspective. We also always appreciate that, at best, these are translations. Oh, yeah. And yeah. probably poor translations. Yeah. But, I mean, but we have to translate at some point. If we oh, want yeah, to communicate it to other human beings, just like if, you, if the Italian wanted to communicate to you, at course. some point he would, have made it, he would have had to make an attempt to speak English, or you would have had to make an attempt to speak Italian, one or the other. Well, he had to, to do an athletic ability to catch up to me. <laughs> yeah, or he could just, like, attack me, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, Baines, what did you want to get out of this meeting? I mean, this, these meetings are partly for the edification of the people in our community. Um, I think they're partly to kind of give us ideas for future actions, um, and they're partly just for community building purposes to, to get everyone a chance to, to meet everyone else. But I think, I mean, my objective of this meeting is not as important as yours. What were you hoping to get out of the meeting? Oh, I came here to learn. Okay. So, and, and that's a good objective, absolutely. And I think, you know, everyone has different objectives, and you know, I think that, that sort of overlapping consensus is a good thing. Not everyone is... Is his interest in exactly the same goals. So. We didn't even know what we were coming to. We just knew it was vegan and activism, so we <laughs> agreed, and then we asked on the way. <laughs> yeah. Cool. I had a question. Um, you said 
in, early on in the talk that there was like the fourth demonstration you went to in Portland. It didn't go so well. You said I wanted to know specifically what. You know, it's interesting. Goes well. We we've learned a lot of things, and I think the reason the Portland demonstration didn't go so well was because the people were so nice. It was just boring. It was just like we we were so used to getting kind of like attacked and having hostility. I mean, Portland's known as this kind of hipster paradise where everyone's nice to each other and it totally just affirmed the stereotype because we went there like one of the managers came and was like oh you know would you guys go outside and, uh, and they're like okay and that was it and it was like and no one cared I mean it's like what Chris was saying like yeah. the, the worst enemy of progress is if, for people to not care at all you gotta have that argument in order to have the conversation in yeah. the first place yeah. Our, yeah it doesn't have to be a hostile argument that issue has to be a table there has to be there has to be some energy you know if, if change requires energy and if, if we want to change the inertia of this system, there has to be some sort of provocation. And that's, I mean, that's true whether you're in... Go ahead, Adrian. Oh, no, I was, I was going to wait for you. Okay, well, that, I think that's true what, what, regardless of what sort of change you're trying to accomplish, whether it's change in the context, even with, in the context of corporations, they understand this. Yeah, I'm just curious on what, like, things you learned, like, early on. Was that really most of the things you learned? So, we learned a lot, yeah. Go I was going to say, a, a lot of the stuff we learned was just kind of tactically. Like, how do we go into a place and, and, and pull something off without kind of, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, fumbling, like, before and just kind of, and just destroying mm -hmm. the plan. So I think along along with kind of the, the, the strategy of, of, like, um, you know, what is a good target and what what how where are we going to get like a desired response to tell the story that we want to tell but yeah. i also think just kind of just pure tactics you know it, things from simply like as do we hold the video camera when we walk in or do we pull the video camera out afterwards you yeah. know how do we shoot you know the video and things like that i mean i was shooting the video in that one so that was my perspective but yeah um i mean i'm sure there's other things that we've learned yeah just through doing yeah that was definitely one of the most important ones though that you know it, it, it's not interesting, the video and the, the demonstration in the protest just isn't interesting if there's no reaction. And that oftentimes the most effective, I mean the two most effective demonstrations just measured by how many people have talked about it and viewed our demonstrations are the two ones where we probably got the most aggressive and hostile reaction by the target. The Stanford action that Brian talked about, which has been viewed by thousands of people and talked about, like it's, I mean Priya told me that, I mean when you first got involved with DOC, it was like, wow, I can't believe this, you just watch it over and over again. And we had, there's this group in LA that doesn't even do a watch style of actors, and they're focused on Italian Vita section. One of the organizers saw this video and told me, like, the beginning of every meeting, they're watching the studio, just because it just fired them up so much, and just, the energy of this confrontation, of this crowd of, you know, yuppie elites screaming at these protesters, and even yelling, like, oh, you're going to face some violence now, if you don't get out of here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, all, all in defense of eating animals, you know, like, you really care that much? We can watch those two videos later. Yeah. Well, we should watch one of, some of the more recent ones. I think yeah, the recent ones are much more polished, and they're more representative of what we've been doing now. Yeah, and not that we won't do those things anymore, but um, mm -hmm. and you can, people can certainly go see them for themselves. But so you, you measure it based on the number of views, or how do you, how do you measure it? There are a lot of measures you use, and I don't think, you know, this is a very complex system, so trying to evaluate progress is very difficult. Views is one of them, but I think even more important than views is engaged users. How much feedback are we getting? Um, and, you know, we have like a hierarchy of feedback, and the, the, the hierarchy, I think it's almost... I'm going to use a term that anyone who's not an economist is not going to care about, but the, I think there's almost a lexicographical priority in terms of how important the high-quality feedback is. So the absolute best feedback we get and the thing that we care most about is, does someone go out and do some activism in response to this? Like, that is, like, just better than anything. One step underneath that is, are they engaging us? Do they come and talk to us? Do they talk about how, do, do they say something like what Priya said, what Vita told us in Los Angeles, that they're watching it over and over again? A step down from that would be like, are they commenting and sharing it on, on some social media? A step down from that would be liking it. A step down from that would be just seeing it. So YouTube views are one measure. They're actually, from my perspective, a fairly unimportant measure. Um, but they are correlated with the important measures. Because if you have hundreds and hundreds of people going and doing a copycat action, which is the most important measure, then probably you're going to get a lot of views, too. So all the measures are correlated with one another. What are some of the things that you have at Chipotle in terms of the response? So they, they've written to us multiple times, and mm -hmm. that was one of our original reactions, to, get, to, to try and get their headquarters to write to us. And they've written to us multiple times and tried to basically bribe us to stop our campaign and say, like, oh, we're all on the same side. Here, we're going like, to say positive things about you, and like, you did such a good job. I, when they wrote this, I was like, oh, who do you think you are? Like, seven-year-old kids who, like, all we need is a pat on the back and we'll go away? This is a protest campaign. Um, they have shut down a store in San Francisco. Um, and, you know, and we know but prior to the Cultivate Festival, which is a huge part of their marketing, I mean, I think it was 200,000 people attended this protest, and the cultural 
waves beyond just the festival itself are far bigger than that because they have a massive positive press around Cultivate. Um, we know that all of their employees were talking about us even before we got in. Because all of our, I, I think it was, were you Brian the one who told us? No, Ashley was the one who was yeah, saying, like, she heard, she heard all these employees talking about, I wonder when the protests are coming. I heard there's really? a protest coming. Yeah. yeah. So they, they've been telling their employees. And so it's, it's infused the culture of this company and, and infused, and now I think, and back then, this is July of last year, it was just something the company was talking about. At this point, it's something that Salon.com is talking about. I mean, Salon.com is not even an animal rights group. This is a national news periodical, and they're talking about humane slaughter. And, when, and the best thing about that article was, and this is why I said we are leveraging Chipotle, is that article wasn't just about Chipotle's lies. It was about the concept of humane slaughter and this change that's happening in the animal rights movement, away from just focusing on bigger cages and better deaths and towards just animal liberation and, and the idea that every animal, every sentient being, has an equal right to live their life in dignity. And that's, that's the sort of leveraging I think the animal rights movement needs to be focused on. Yeah. Adrian, you had something to say a little bit earlier, I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's fine. Um, well, I just wanted to say that for me personally, um, organizing a couple of these um, actions in Sacramento, that I have seen a huge growth and I have seen people talking about this organization immensely and I know this because um, I defend DFC <laughs> a lot. And uh, just Thanks, it, uh -huh. <laughs> my pleasure. Just recently, uh, we had a woman that um, was not liking the type of activism that we were doing, how, and she didn't join the action. And I saw her yesterday, and we talked about it. And she mentioned that she's going to come to next month because of such of the positive feedback from all the activists and that we've been having a really great turnout. We've had three the first time. We had three people. And after that, we had 10. Last yeah. month, we had 15. Wow. So I'm hoping that. Congratulations, Adrian. Good work. 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 So I think it's important, and I know that you guys emphasize, you know, we're just trying to start a dialogue. We're just wanting this discussion that is, you know, just everybody avoids. And, and these are tough topics, but we absolutely do have have to talk about them, and the more often we do it, the easier it becomes, and I know a lot of activists do think that it is confrontational, and people are going to shut us down as soon as we walk into the restaurant, and that might be true for some, but what about the others that actually are going to listen, and Chipotle is a good, great place to be because of the people that are there, I guess for the most part, uh, maybe are a little bit more conscious of the environment and animal suffering and things like that, and, and then, but also at the same time, that is um, Chipotle is exploiting those people as well. Yeah, they and totally kind of are writing on their emotions. They and, totally are and their morals. Mm -hmm. so, Taking the yeah, money. I think this is, um, and I didn't hear your guys' story before. I didn't know the the history of how you all got started in your story, but your story is actually exactly like mine. Prior to meeting this group. I work. I mean, I literally worked with every single group, and I didn't have that fulfillment and that and that feeling of um, community mm -hmm. that I do now that I'm with this organization. And so, I think that's important for activists to not be burnt out and yeah. you know and enjoy what they're doing and, and feel like they are making an impact. Because I know we are. I know. Yeah. We are. I haven't yeah. got my mind. Yeah. At all. Thank you so much, Adrian. Seriously. Yeah, we're really glad we have you. Your, your story brings up another really important point. Is this other activist, you know, uh, quite had questions about you know our campaign and such. So much like you, Phil, like it takes you know some amount of bravery. A lot of people say to do some of these things, but to be sitting in a room with people who all sort of seem to be thinking one way and then to question that, that also is I think very brave of you. Yes. And it's actually been really important to our growth. Uh, all of the things that, that we do, we think a lot about. And sometimes, you know, people come with questions that, you know, make us really challenge the way that we think. Um, and and we've, uh, we were not originally exactly like we are now. We are always changing. We're trying to grow. As we're trying to grow the movement, we're trying to grow ourselves personally and DXC. Um, and so uh, thank you, Phil, for being able to like... Felix, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I wish I would be Phil, but I can't do that. <laughs> Thank you, Felix, for, for expressing those concerns and those questions, because it's crucial 
to our growth, uh, you know, as a movement, as individuals, as DXE, to to have people feel like they can ask us questions and to to question our views and such. And so, um, yeah, I've, if uh, if people don't ask us or people don't people disagree silently, then we never have the opportunity to answer any questions. And when you have a question, other people have that same question in mind. And so when we, when we talk to you, we're not just talking to you, we're talking to lots of other people who may be listening on the internet. And so it's really, it's really beneficial for us. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So, so if no one else has something to say, it's, it's now been a little yeah. over three hours. We've been sitting down. You know, we should, we should wrap it up, I think. Yeah, kinda, so can I just give one concrete example of, of, of what Chris just said? I mean... So early on in the Tripoli campaign, we weren't using pretty much any images of animals, and there are complicated reasons for that that we won't go into because a lot of us don't feel comfortable with a lot of the traditional images of gory animals, and we almost never, we still never use those. But it was actually Brian's girlfriend, Kitty, came to us and said to us once, like, I don't think people get. It. I mean, if only you have this text, it's not as emotionally evocative, and I just think people don't get it. And she was like super tentative, and was like, oh, I don't know if I should tell them. And she was like, really, I still love you. And she kept saying all these positive things. Kitty is like the most positive person in the world. But we, she started a big discussion in, in this house, actually in exactly this space once, where we talked about it for like an hour and a half, and said like, hey, yeah, we should probably do this. This makes total sense. We're like in our own little world, and we obviously understand the message of our protest, but it's very important for us to start getting kind of the animals' images actually out in our protest more. And since then, I think at pretty much every protest, we've had animal images. And, and we've tried to do it in a way that's very respectful of each animal's individual dignity, because one of the reasons we weren't using animal images was because we felt like it was kind of just weird to talk about this random animal that we don't have any relationship, we don't know their story, and it almost commodifies them to think of them as this massive individual animals that... Like, it's just kind of like going to civil rights poll test holding, like, a person of color. And, you're, and someone asks you, like, who's that? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. It's just some person of color, you know? But what especially we try to like do... a white person. Exactly. Especially like a white person. It would be strange to do. But that, that question and that criticism, because she was saying, like, yeah, I just don't... I'm not feeling it because of this. Really triggered a lot of dialogue and made, made us change a concrete practice. And, and it, that stayed that way, basically, for every protest since then. So. Not even... Yeah, that. I... Sorry, go ahead. I, I, I have the same question. I, I thought you guys did not use images, and that was something that I thought I should compliment you guys on. We don't use gory images still. Okay, You're so right, we I, don't I, use I, the I, gory I, images. I don't know about this, but um, what I find often is that it puts off people when you, when you show images, and that, that immediately frames you as a sensational person rather than somebody with a message. Because people see that image, and immediately they're not even reading the subtext. Whereas when you say this is violence or whatever your text is, text you compel them to read that and nothing else. There's no distraction, there's focus. And, yeah. and I like that part of your campaign. Hmm. I mean, that's my view. And yeah, yeah. that's why I wish, uh, I, if you guys had written down whatever discussions you had before you decided to use animal images, yeah. of course, it's not also dignified in my opinion. That's a personal thought, not necessarily to do with liberation, but... Sure. We're uh, actually in the middle of writing an article right now to like, try to state why we use the kind of messaging... And that would be interesting for me to read, yeah. What I think has is, is been even better is because we've had this kind of diverse array of opinions on kind of what the most effective messaging is, is I was only kind of tangentially involved with collecting some of the data at the beginning, but a lot of other uh, members of DXE have been collecting a lot of data for a study on kind of the most effective kind of animal imaging that we can use in our activism. So there are various kinds. We could use kind of gory images. We could use uh, moral messages, using moral authority. So figures that people already respect, like Mahatma Gandhi, you know, with quotes uh, from him about uh, kind of... Uh, I think it's like the metric of the moral greatness mm -hmm. of a nation is based upon the way in which it's kind of yeah. Yeah. yeah, You know, so we have that. Um, and then there's also like hopeful images of animals, so animals who are free and happy. Um, we're testing a variety of different uh, things and we're collecting a lot of data. Yeah. There's a little bit of the last one that you said, uh, other than the recent uh, German people who released that cows or whatever. Mm -hmm. You guys have seen. Yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah, that's that's really awesome. I mean, you don't seldom see the the other side that that utopian picture. You never see. Yeah. yeah. And often you only see the gory and the sensational side. Yeah. Yeah. Which is depressing, actually. Yeah. Is so we'll see what's next. Dancing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a beautiful video. That, that, that is a beautiful video. Yeah. yeah. Anyways. Oh, yeah, no, yeah, it. That's not part. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I'd say. I mean, I'm I'm getting tired of sitting on my ass, so I want to get out. Sure. So why don't we uh why don't we wrap it up?
briefly, and then maybe we can watch a video or two. Um, yeah, and normally, cool. normally what we do after is just immediately try to plan an action if there's anyone who'd like to participate. But since today we have a potluck immediately after the event, I don't think we'll have time. So we'll just watch a couple of videos maybe and have an additional discussion if people would like. Um, and then eat some good food, including some leftover birthday cake from last night. Oh, by the way, everyone should wish, wish, please wish the beautiful Priya Sahani a birthday, because today is her birthday, April 1st. Oh. If you leave before then, please Thank wish her a happy birthday. Should you, oh, she deserves it. Yeah, let's take a good picture. Yeah, let's do it. And if you if you don't want to be in the picture, it's still like cool. Okay, yeah. Cool. Oh, and also, if you do not want to be, we should, I should have said this at the beginning. If you do not want to be in the video, you went out of the video. Okay, we will edit you out. I'll cut you out of. The